bunch of kids fixing up a camp, getting ready for camp, and uh, mom goes around killing them because her kid died because she was too horny, right? Yes, I think that's exactly what happened. Brunch! Hit it, boys! All right, we're not screwing around this week. This is this is like a an old school season one brunch episode. This is a themed thing where we're doing a deep dive, trying to get some answers to questions. Hold on to your butts. We're coming in with an idea. Yeah, <laughs> and it's the reason this episode is late is because it's the first time in so long that we've had an idea that we didn't actually know how to uh, like how to handle it. Attack an idea. <laughs> we. The Friday the 13th was on. I'd never seen that before. Shot you a text, and I was like, we never really talked about the Halloween classics because probably neither of us have seen the Halloween classics. Friday the 13th was, like, the one that I had seen, and I uh, saw it, like, a year or two ago. It, Harpoon had, like, this uh, outdoor movie night yeah. sort of thing where they played it on, like, a bl- one of those blow-up theater things. Oh, I remember. And they just you, you they served to beer and stuff, and I watched Friday the 13th outside. It was the, the coolest night. Speaking of which, Free Pub, shout out uh, our friends at Night Shift. They've got a thing on Halloween. I can't go to it. I don't know what it is. It's a... Uh, but it's, like, a not-your-average Halloween thing. It's a... It's a not let's like uh the saying your daddy's Halloween. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing there, but it seems very exciting and if I could go, I would go. I feel like I'm kind of like retiring from Halloween for a little bit. People man, people come up to me left and right and when I say people left and right, I mean the two coworkers that that I that I speak <laughs> that to, speak every to day. you. <laughs> yeah, that are willing to associate with me. Uh a lot of people like, "Hey, favorite time of year, Dave. Where the costume go? What it look like?" And I really just have I have no idea. I have nothing. Yeah. Same. Like the, the thing I think of with you is like we, we could blow it out, do some big Midsommar thing, because I feel like that's really been the only thing we've cared for this past year. I had one idea. <laughs> what was it? But I was like uh, too lazy to, to put it into into motion or even approach you with it. But uh, I thought that um, Kathy and dead Laura Brannigan would be like a great couple's oh, costume. Oh, God. That would have been so good. Yeah. Kathy. That would have been a great costume. Twitter fingers become trigger <laughs> fingers. Or is it the other way around? How does Drake say that? Uh, Number trigger, one, Drake trigger Puck fingers become Twitter fingers. Become I Twitter think. fingers. Drake is so much better that like I know that Drake is good, and I just never get into him. And every time new Drake comes up, people are like, "You hear the new Drake?" I race to listen to it, and I'm like, "I don't really like it that much." And then like yeah. five months later, I hear one of those songs, and I'm like, "What is this? this is Why doesn't anybody ever... talk about this?" This yeah. is so what oh, you. <laughs> This Drake guy. The uh, the the last one that that off, I think it was his last album. I don't know. I can't even keep track. But uh, uh, nice for what? That song rules. And the nice for what is one of the best. Was nice for what this past year or two years ago? I think it was like a year, at least a year ago. I've been chipping away at my. Uh, I had to make it secret. I really. I recently learned you can make playlists secret on Spotify, Ooh. which. Like people probably been seeing some like personal playlists <laughs> out there if they're following me. I think I have like eight. Uh, Spotify followers, but uh, the people have probably seen the like get through the day DJ. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, I feel like if you're if all your playlists were public and nobody reached out to you to like wellness check. No, I don't it, really. I, the, the 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 playlist that I that I would worry about is uh, I don't know. People would be like, "Hey, who's so and so?" Oh, they saw okay. like who you make you playlists that, huh? with, and I'm like, New Age mixtape. You mind your New Age mis- mixtape. Uh, we there was a mixtape reference in something that we saw because what we ultimately determined and by ultimately penultimately because we pivoted with the idea was like you know what we haven't seen the halloween classics we haven't seen the the horror thrillers i grew up watching all the halloween movies like meaning halloween and such but not any of like the uh the big names such as friday the 13th and we often embrace the pop culture gaps that we have because the things that we do know about we know everything about <laughs> right and why know just a little about something? So, like, why see The Exorcist or whatever? But I don't know. In our old age, might as well be a little different and see a bunch of stuff and yeah. actually know what we're talking about. I don't have anything better going on. Right. So yeah. Why I was not? like, hey, do you have time to watch every classic horror film? You're like, yeah. Uh, and so we knocked him out. <laughs> we saw every 
classic Halloween thing. We saw uh, in some we'd seen before. Like I'd seen Halloween, you'd seen Friday the 13th. But yeah. this episode, we are going to cover Halloween, Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Exorcist, Scream, an episode of Dawson's Creek, The Boy Meets World Horror episode, a Halloween episode of Everybody Loves Raymond. And then I don't know what our conclusion is, what we're trying to, to get to the bottom of here. Really, we just like <laughs> we're not found really going a, anywhere. Yeah, we, but we found driving around that we were texting each other as we were watching. Them. Oh, yeah. Mainly, uh, every horror thing has at least some degree of very heavy horniness <laughs> to <laughs> yes. it. Honestly, every, every Halloween thing has... Sex is a big part of Halloween oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which like, couldn't be me, but <laughs> sex is a big thing of uh, so Halloween... You no, know, you know when I said that I was retiring media. from Halloween, you know what that meant, right? Yeah, there's no like, sex for me. Oh, I can't. Oh, shout shout out to uh, shout out to to Alex Cameron. Recent obsession, musical obsession of yours truly. On his new album, he's got a song called "The End Is Nigh." And I told you guys, this guy is like my current uh, Misty replacement because he's just got absolutely incredible lyrics, and he seems quite over everything. One of the lyrics, one of the lines is, uh, "There's a guy who thinks I'm fucking his girlfriend." And he says he's going to make me cry, but I couldn't get it up if I wanted to, and I already want to die. <laughs> oh I'm like, oh, God. boy. That is incredible. Speak to me. Touch my soul, Alex. <laughs> so th- that what an incredible reaction to have somebody be like, hey, you fucking my girl, and being like, dude, the idea of having sex with anybody, <laughs> please, you have got the wrong guy. Um, so we didn't, watch, we didn't watch Hocus Pocus, but I did, I did yeah. watch Hocus Pocus for the first time, like, three or four weeks ago and let me tell you the horniness is with that movie for sure yes. too because uh sarah jessica parker plays her her character description is basically horny witch right and she's very hot in that movie by the way like, sarah, Je- I never, sarah jessica parker great i never i never thought that i never thought that sarah jessica parker was like ever really like bringing it your generation probably knows sarah jessica parker as like the middle-aged Carrie, still having Carrie fun yeah. yeah yeah yes definitely and her character in that in that movie is horny witch and she is the second horniest character in that movie because the kid is just yeah trying to get it done i the entire <laughs> movie i caught a little bit of it on uh tv and i was like man this is not even close to how i remember this movie <laughs> i don't know how i remember this movie but it wasn't that bad. It was okay. People I, go nuts over it. I remember they, uh, the Sarah Jessica Parker character, correct me if I'm wrong, they were trying to inject quite a bit of Phoebe into her vibe, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was, she was all out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even like had like the, the very blonde. I don't know if that's, that's like, a, like a, a hair racism thing. Uh, she's like a the dumb blonde. Oh, the, oh that's a uh, that's an example of a stereotype. Is yeah. What no, it's hair racism. Hair racism. <laughs> Uh, shouts out Friends. Also, Phoebe would have wor- F- Friends. If you made minor tweaks to, would work today. If you were just like, "Yo, Phoebe does drugs," everyone would be like, "Oh, cool, you're so brave, Phoebe," right. and they would totally accept her character. You'd have to take out the gay jokes, which would ruin like half the scripts of Friends. One of the things that we saw was uh, Scream, and one of my notes in that is: Was Courtney Cox just not allowed to play a good person? <laughs> She's fat shaming Kenny left and right, which I did remember. I remember when they showed Kenny or cameraman. I was like, "Oh, she is awful to that poor guy," and then he gets killed. So. Those were the pieces that we chose. I'll say them again. Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, The Exorcist, Scream, an episode of Dawson's Creek, an episode of Boy Meets World, <laughs> and an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond. You know, the classics. Yes, the classics. And we're going to determine, I, th- I say at the end, we just determine uh, where the butt go, I think would okay. be the, uh, the, the fair thing. And you're probably thinking from the ones we just listed off, I can just skip to the end because I know where the butt go, but you can't be sure. You definitely You don't sure. know that we're going to pick Everybody Loves Raymond. So... Uh, I'll start with The Exorcist, 1973. I'm just going to tell you right off the top, the butt don't go here. I hated this movie. (laughs) I didn't hate it. It was for sure a slow burn. It was was deeply weird and disturbing, which is fine. And, like, that's what you kind of want from Halloween movies a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. It's... It definitely suffered from, like, I know this is a, a horrific movie that, like, everybody went crazy for. Everybody thinks that it's, like, the most disturbing movie of all time. Blah, blah, blah. 
I can see why people thought that back in the day because there were some truly terrible things in this movie. Yeah, that made me sounds, feel uncomfortable right sights, now. Yeah, some of the sights, uh, some of, like the things that the the possessed girl says. It's like a it's like a eight year old, a ten year old. Biggest know, plot hole in the movie. I, we can skip. That's my biggest note on the movie. Uh, where is it? Let me see. Plot hole. She repeatedly uses some pretty harsh language, specifically homophobic terms, awful, horrible stuff. But if this movie is about religion. And the girl is possessed by the devil. Wouldn't she be LGBTQ friendly, given that in the 70s, that was a big thing they were pushing. Catholics and many religions were pushing that were pushing uh, homosexuality as a sin. So if this girl is possessed by the devil and this is the 70s and these guys are Catholic as hell, they're doing a whole lot of holy water throwing power. of Christ compels you. Wouldn't she be like, hey, love is love. <laughs> versus some of the homophobic things she's saying. I, I suppose, uh, yeah, like it, the devil would be pushing like right. gay rights and, yes. and gay thing. Yeah, that makes sense. In which case, now if we're watching it, then it's a plot hole either way because we're saying, wait, the, the devil seems a little more accepting than... Right, it wouldn't age well. Than these religious... I mean, this movie doesn't age well anyway. I don't need to hear that term <laughs> one way or the other. But she is going nuts on the homophobic terms. She's also going nuts on like... Uh, like really sexual things, and yeah. I was like, "This is very uncomfortable." When she takes the cross and uses it, and for things that shouldn't it shouldn't be used for, yeah, not for me. I'll I'll tell you what, man. I I, I wasn't even excited to see this movie, as you can probably tell, because I'm not <laughs> excited to have seen this movie. Uh, just the whole religious aspect of it—that like it's a horror movie built around a religion. Going into that, I felt like seeing a horror movie built around religion yeah. sounds like a horror. Right. I felt like an old guy who's just like learning about two people living two like unmarried people living together. It's like, just just don't shove it in my face, man. (laughs) Or to to stick with the 70s and homophobia, like an old guy finding out someone they know is gay and being like, oh, I'm totally cool with it. Just like just like keep it to yourself. That's kind of how I feel about religion in horror movies. Yeah, I'm not I'm not the target for religious (laughs) horror movies. Uh yeah, the I mean this one it, it, I didn't I didn't love it, but it it's was it, it was it was fine. This movie it, sucks. The payoff wasn't as big as you would hope for a movie that takes like an hour and a half to get to the payoff. Yeah, it, it also starts. Uh, another huge note is uh, it quote it opens in Iraq in subtitles <laughs> yeah. is exactly something we would say about this movie if we didn't see it and were just throwing outlandish <laughs> things out there. To make you question whether or not we've seen it, it's like a, it's like a, it starts out in Iraq. I don't know what they're, what the, it's like, a, some like excavator or whatever. Like they're searching for. I think so. They're like looking a, for stuff, runix or, or whatever. I don't know. The big thing I'll say is uh, killer soundtrack. I did not know that song. The you know that one? Yeah. I did not know that was The Exorcist. Yeah, I thought that was just every Halloween movie. Maybe it just set the set the. The bar for every Halloween movie. It uh, sounded like the same song. And this is one Halloween of two. Well, we're going to talk about the music and a few of these these pieces of art. But uh, this is one where like soundtrack is so key. Soundtrack is important in horror movies. I realized, and this and Halloween both have just a plus themes. And it was while watching another one that I realized how important the music can be because it really made it's it really cool off this other <laughs> movie. But Exorcist and Halloween a plus. No, yeah, The Exorcist has the best shot out of any of these movies. Maybe like the best shot of any movie like ever. What is, is that? Is when the when the doctor or not the doctor, the um he's not the doctor. He's like the priest or whatever. Like the head priest yeah. who was in Iraq when he gets out of the car and the light shines down oh, onto yeah. the sidewalk. That shot rules. Yeah. Good job. Shouts out whoever uh did The Exorcist. Also, I meant to note this before we get into this uh big extravaganza. Some names to know because they're going to come up probably a couple times. Uh and they, they they weave through a lot of these pieces. Kevin Williamson, he wrote Scream, and I know what you did last summer, and he created Dawson's Creek. So there's some horror ties Ooh. there. Wes Craven, uh, I know him from Scream, but he made A Nightmare on Elm Street, which I didn't know. And Ray Barone, father of two, hated by his wife. Let's continue. Was there any consideration to just like putting this girl out of her misery? <laughs> She's killing her. Not killing her, but... Like, forget to feed her for, <laughs> <laughs> for like, a couple months. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think she was getting there. Because she was looking bad. Yeah. She, she was, was looking terrible. Was, and she was... It was getting, like, very urgent. So I, I'm assuming that that meant that she was going to 
die. Like yeah. her body was going. I mean, the, it's the, a horny the Halloween. demon was going to ruin her body and have to go into somebody else's at some point. Uh, a lot of stuff in these movies happens on beds. This girl uh, was bedridden. She was a real, she was a real grandpa bucket. Charlie Bucket's <laughs> yeah. relatives just hanging out on the bed. But I'll say overall, not a super horny movie. So no, th- this would be well, just what she. There were horny parts. She was. Th- there were some. She wanted it. Horny illusions, but yes. not, uh, not, not a super horny movie. I don't need to talk about this movie anymore. Okay, yeah, I'm good. It, your butt goes nowhere. Do, where does your butt go? In not, in, not here. Okay, I will say though. Uh, it's a horny Halloween. My, <laughs> I just found out that my absolute least favorite and my favorite were written by the same person, which is interesting. Really, but we'll get to there. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Halloween, 1978, classic. Loved it when I was a kid. Love it now. Just the best. Pretty horny movie. The uh, friends go off. They have some sex. And as we learn in Scream from Seth Green's character, if you're in a horror movie, the one thing you never do is have sex. You don't have sex. You don't do drugs. Seth Green? Yeah. That's not Seth Green. In Scream? Yeah, it's not Seth Green. That's Jamie Kennedy. Oh, yeah. Those two are... Uh, interchangeable back That's then. That's true. Yeah. Although Seth Green was uh, Seth Green garnered a lot more eye rolling, but Jamie Kennedy was doing some stupid stuff back then too. As soon as Jamie Kennedy got like his own show and right. like he uh, and he like became mainstream or like a quote unquote like a lister, everybody's yeah. like, "Ugh, this guy." Kids, you'll probably remember the show Punked. Jamie Kennedy, uh, as everybody was racing to do off-brand versions of the show, had his own show called. The Jamie Kennedy experience. Experiment? Experiment, yeah. And uh, you would not get punked, but let me tell you, you would get X'd. <laughs> and they would put a big X over your face because, boy, did they need something to cover up all that red. <laughs> <laughs> and I ain't talking about hair. Talking I about actually the like Jamie Kennedy, but I, he, I don't need him in a, in a uh, starring role. He also, he capitalized on a lot of things. He capitalized on the uh, punked phenomenon. He capitalized on the uh, wangsta yep. era of... Uh, a pop culture. What was the with the Malibu Malibu's, Malibu's most, most wanted? wanted. Was a, the movie was very funny. He played a wanksta whose catchphrase was uh, "Don't be hating," <laughs> which uh, you want to talk about appropriation. I cannot. I, I if I went back and watched that movie, it would, I would probably like want to hate my. I would hate myself for how much I loved that movie when I was younger. Oh god, I never saw that movie. Really? <laughs> Had absolutely zero. It interest was so in that. stupid, but so funny. That seemed like. Such a her, what does he get? He gets kidnapped. Yes. Yeah. All right. Halloween, probably the one of the few of these movies that I completely take seriously. Um, I I wouldn't say that I take it seriously, but it is a it is like right down the middle for what I want in terms of like a, a just like a slasher. Right. Real. Uh, it's an edgier seat thing. Stuff comes out. Uh, some good jump scares, but jump scares the way they're they're meant to be. They're doable jump scares. Maybe because I uh, I was desensitized to them from a young age from watching the movie but the the classic scene the uh the the grave the whole nine excellent soundtrack the little kid who in halloween five i want to say grew up and was a main character and was played by paul rudd hilarious <laughs> my my butt my butt goes all over the 1978 classic halloween i I watched it for the first time a couple of years ago, and I think I talked about it on the on the podcast when I did watch it. Maybe it was I think it was last year actually. It was the first time that I watched it. There's a lot of just like a lot of standing around, a lot of yeah. just like seeing uh, seeing Michael Myers, right? And well, him not really doing anything. That's and I I probably countered that that's what's scary about him is that you never see him running, yeah. you never see him putting in any work in. Uh, Every now and then there's like some someone crawls into a space and he like bends over to try to pick him up. But other than that, Michael Myers never breaks a sweat and he still yeah. catches you every time. Yeah, th- th- I, they say it in Scream uh, where like a lot of the uh, a lot of the fear comes from like the unknown. Right. Or no, that they say that in Boy Meets World. That's what they say. it. Oh, I think. I right. don't know. But I think it was in Boy Meets World. I'll tell you, of all the things that we watched, uh, well, everybody knows where I'm going to make quite the impression. But watching Scream again for the first time. I mean, I've probably seen the movie a hundred times over the years. But, like, sitting down to watch it and be like, all right, let's crack the old knuckles. <laughs> what we got What we got with this this like Scream to, thing? What, it's like an event to that watch it. That was the one that, that made the biggest 
impression on me. But Halloween is the the best of these movies. Halloween I would say. Halloween has a fantastic finish. Mm-hmm. I think it takes a while to get there, and I was very uh, frustrated and annoyed by just like how much how much just like looking at Michael Myers there is. Yeah. So that bothered me a little bit. It does have it doesn't age super well in terms of like the awkwardness of how it's shot and yeah. things like that but i think that that kind of adds to how endearing it is mm-hmm. and overall I, i'd say this is one of the better ones yeah not super horny not super horny but horny a little it has like she has like horny friends it has the normal amount I, it has what i would think would be the normal amount of horniness for a halloween yeah piece of art well i think that it's something that you but have other to mention things- I think something, something that you have to mention when you when you talk about like how horny a lot of Halloween things are. A lot of Halloween things uh, revolve around teenagers right. and high schoolers. So people find out about their parts, and that's that's very accurate. Like it, there's nothing more horny in the world than than a teenager. So uh, yeah, I'd say it's uh, appropriately horny. I have minimal notes for Friday the Thirteenth. I watch it on TV, and I'll say a lot of these I bought on demand uh, because sometimes I don't know if you do this. When you go on demand to watch something and it says it's free and then you start it up and it says like either sci-fi in the corner or Comedy Central or something, I don't know. Is that going to be the real version of that movie or is that going to be an edited for that channel version of that movie? I think it's the edited for that channel version of that movie. I can't do that. Yeah, it's tough. So I ended up, I did that with uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. I started it and saw that it was uh, uh, for some TV channel and I was like, nope, got to buy it. But that's how I saw. I saw Friday the Thirteenth uh, was on it while I was at work, and I was catching it here and there. Didn't make a huge impression on me. Was quite horny. Bunch of kids fixing up a camp, getting ready for camp, and uh, mom goes around killing them because her kid died because she was too horny, right? Yes, I think that's exactly what happened. That's ultimately what yeah, happened. Yeah, You're, and. Uh, you know that that Jason's got this big tie-in, but she's not. But it's the, her mom that's killing everybody in the the first one because she's mad that she was too horny to save her drowning kid. I think yeah, I think that's exactly what happened. All right, and that'll do it for Friday the Thirteenth <laughs> talk. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Shaka Khan because. Ain't nobody this episode. Nightmare on Elm Street, nineteen eighty four. This one I took copious notes. Yes, on. okay. I was just gonna say here's where uh, here's where the notes come in because Kinda there's crazy. so much to say about this one. So this is about falling asleep and in your nightmare a guy comes and kills you, but he kills you IRL. And if people are watching you while you sleep, it's quite embarrassing because it looks like you're just getting <laughs> fucked up by absolutely nobody. <laughs> by ghosts. And, and I gotta say, it does. It's it's clever because it puts a spin on dying in your sleep. That is That's true. a big careful yeah. what you wish for. Yeah, Everybody wants true. to die in their <laughs> sleep, and they go to sleep, and old Freddy, with Christmas colors, by the way. Freddy's yeah. a big Christmas color guy. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I didn't know is that Freddy Krueger is apparently a, a pedophile. Uh-oh. Yeah. You didn't know that either? I don't. I guess they don't, like, specifically, uh, like, address that he's, like, into these kids yeah. in the movie. But when I went to rent it, it says, a pedophile burned at the stake for his crimes, comes back to kill people in the neighborhood or whatever. Yo, if you were punished for your crimes, you don't get to retaliate That's true. for being punished. Right. Even Steven, Freddy, you right. gone. There's like, uh, th- th- there should be like a, there should have been like closure there because You're right, they, you did some awful stuff. And, and the, all the other people, like, they didn't fuck up. They did it the right way. They, they got Freddy because he committed those crimes and they took care of business themselves. They lit the house on fire with him inside it. That should have been the end of that. Why does he get to come back? I know. Freddy's quite selfish. Uh, so this one, you're going to be hearing a lot of the a lot of the horny stuff. Because this was quite a horny movie. There's a guy, Rod. Rod? Is that the guy's name? Uh, is it his name? I don't know. He wears he, a leather jacket. He yeah. comes in guns blazing, talking about boners. This guy just sucks. Yeah, his name is Rod. And everyone agrees that this guy sucks. And that's just like what grounds the movie. That's a common thing in horror movies, too, is that everyone is on the same page that this. There's one guy that everybody wants to die. This especially horny idiot. (laughs) Everybody hates. And that's what kind of keeps everybody on the same. My next note (laughs) is no matter how much times change, whether it's 
over th- like thinking stuff in society or being considerate political correctness or whatever that character will always exist yep. he will always exist and mark is we always need something that Z. unites us right and it's generally a horny dumb idiot uh so he carries around a knife too Why? this rod guy he carries around a knife uh, He's a horny guy who carries around a knife. That's a bit concerning. And he is harassing this girl, who you, at least I thought was the main character. He's harassing this girl, and uh, her name is Tina. And it takes 12 minutes for you to read. He walks over. He's like, hey, babe, I had a boner for you all night. <laughs> it's a horny Halloween. And she's like, get out of here, Rod. You're a jerk. We all hate you. And everybody's like, Rod sucks. And then he keeps coming back. And like they keep ending up in these social settings. And Rod is there. And he's like pulling out his knife at points. And at some at one point, the two other, the other, uh, th- this couple is they're about to leave. And Tina says, Hey, don't leave me alone with this maniac, right? And they're like, okay. And then she starts making out with Rod in like a very... Rod's not initiating this. I'm okay with this. Right. I'm like, like, what's going on here? Is she... Is he assault... What's going on? 12 minutes into the movie, you realize they're in a relationship. Yes. They could not present that... Please don't leave me alone with my boyfriend who I'm going to willingly have sex with. She goes ham on him. Yeah. And it's not like a, at least to me, it's not like a, uh, he has control over her and she's like doing stuff uh, that because that, she's scared of him or whatever. Like it's just presented in a very strange way. This also happens in the Boy Meets World episode in a scene between Eric and Jennifer Love Hewitt. But we will get oh, to yes. that. Oh, yes. Uh, the One of my favorite things about Rod's introduction is that he comes in and uh, it's like, Johnny Depp's character, who, by the way, I didn't know that Johnny Depp was introduced with uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Hell yeah. He got the all introducing Johnny Depp It treatment. says introducing yes, on it? Yes, yeah. Wow, so they knew that he was yes. going to be a thing. Yeah. They don't do that in uh, Friday the 13th. Kevin Bacon's in that. Okay, yeah. But was, that, that might not have been his first thing. I don't know. I feel like Kevin Bacon's been acting since he left the womb. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they it, it, when Rod comes in, he sees Johnny Depp's character and the two girls. They're hanging out. He comes out of the bushes... That's yeah. how like, he comes out of the bushes in the backyard and he goes, hey, what's going on here? An orgy? Yes. I, I, I don't think that guy realizes like how orgies work or what they're classified by. Three people, so people is walking not down an the orgy. street. Were they, they're going to school, weren't they? No, oh, no, was, no. This is at, at night, when, night they're, yeah. when they're hanging out. So uh, she has Tina and Rod have a lot of sex because Tina has had a dream about Freddy Krueger the last night mm-hmm. and she's worried about it so her friends are there to keep her company so she has sex with rod and then says something about she says like good job tarzan jane happy now <laughs> gotta this, this tina i know they're all young and they're figuring out who they are but they deserve each other but right just, just a, a crazy relationship those two kids have uh she then falls back asleep and they also say like they also have sex and then they say like no more fights no more fights. And they're like, okay, no more fights. We, we didn't see them really fight before that. Right. It wasn't a fight. It just yeah. looked like it just seemed like he wasn't friends with those people and they all <laughs> hated him. That yeah. wasn't a fight. Right. And if so, are they bullying him? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really understand that part. But I thought it was funny that they were like, no more fights when there was yeah. never a fight. Yeah. It was just them being two problematic people who end up having sex they with do, each other. Right. They, they seemingly don't like each other. So uh, she falls back asleep and Freddie... Is in the house, not in the house. He's he's in her dream. In the dream. Uh, and he, I didn't know this about Freddy Krueger. Got some Inspector Gadget to him. Yeah, he's uh he's uh Mrs. Incredible. What's that? Is he's, that the Incredibles? Yeah, I never she's saw the that. rubber the rubber band one. Ah, he's he. I didn't know that he could do that either. Were They're you just an like, Inspector Gadget guy? Yes, he was all about yeah. just. But as long as he says he wants his body to do something, <laughs> it does it. Yeah, but he did it with like with gadgets. Because That's true. You get it? His he's name a, is Mister Mister Incredible Gadget. He's a real Mister Incredible <laughs> yeah, Gadget. Yes. Uh, but Mrs. Incredible, not Gadget, not to be confused with Mister Mister Incredible Gadget. She just like just like a rubbery band body. And I think that's more what Freddie was because his arms were like they didn't have any help. They just right. went that way. And he didn't he just. He did a couple things that were just, like, unnecessary. At one point, he's like, hey, check this out. And he slices his hand off. Yes. And this, she's like. I, I got to tell you, like, 80% so no of hand the anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you're. So now you're less dangerous to me. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but I do like his, his, like, pension for party tricks. Yes. 
<laughs> he entertains the kids before he. I see your champagne bottle and raise <laughs> you my hand. I, I, I gotta sell. I gotta say, like eighty percent of the things that Freddy Krueger does in this movie, extremely unnecessary. He's a real goofball. He's not quite. He's. I don't know. Would he fall into the flamboyant villain category? I don't know. I'm I'm very hesitant to label like Freddy Krueger as like a goofball or like a flamboyant exactly. he's villain a because he's a pedophile. Yeah. yeah. He's, there's that that's a bridge too far. Uh so he kills her, slices her up real good. Uh and there is the a lightest lot of blood. The lightest light red paint. Mm-hmm. Like very thin like translucent re- light red paint that doesn't look anything like blood. <laughs> it is just absolutely everywhere. And then the next day when they're all at school, you know, uh, just carrying on. That's a huge part of horror movies. You just go to school the next Horniness day. Horniness and going to school the next day after your best friend's been killed. The education doesn't stop. The main character, who, again, you think early on. I thought early on, I'm like, this is a movie about Tina. And then they, they, they pull a 24. Yeah. Kill her right quick. So it's about her friend. And her friend sees a pool of Tina's blood in the hall and follows it. And As that's one like does. blood colored. What? Are you saying like there's no consistency there? Absolutely not. You think they ran out of paint when they just like painted Tina's body? They ra- they ran out of paint that looked nothing like blood. And they were like, oh no, now what are we going to do? <laughs> well, we got this blood colored the- <laughs> stuff we could use. Fine. Whatever. They won't know the difference. So that's a consistency issue. Uh, Johnny Depp's character is an idiot. He sits on his bed with headphones plugged into his record player and a TV in front of him. And there's a scene of him doing that, and I'm like, "What's going on here?" And they What's they cut watching, and they cut to something else, and they cut back to him, and his mom actually walks in, and she's like, "What the hell's wrong with you? Why are you <laughs> why are you watching a TV with headphones plugged into the record player?" And he says he was watching a Victoria's Secret fashion show. While listening to music. And she's like, well, don't you want... Or like a Miss America thing. I feel like I missed this And she's part. like, well, don't you want to know uh, what they're saying? And he's like, I don't need to know what they're saying. Did this happen? Classic. classic. This definitely did not happen. Absolutely, it did. Did it really? Yeah, you just send me a little hornball. Really? Even though he's got he's got his girlfriend. He's getting a regular. He's got, uh, he's got the main character. He's dating her. Yeah, uh, but they, I don't think they're uh, they're not doing it. Are they not? I don't think so. I think they are going to, and uh, he's, he's like, hey, what do you say? We get stupid, and she's like, no, this night's about Tina. We have to oh, yeah, stay in right. a house with her while she has sex, <laughs> while she has very loud sex. <laughs> yeah. But we can't do it. Begins because... talking about Tarzan with who the, the guy that's either the most dangerous person in school or, like, the biggest loser in school. There's a lot of stuff in these movies that are more suited for 2019 where I feel like everybody's nice to each other and people from different uh, groups of, I don't know, people from different uh, high school stereotypes hang out with each other. Like the Jamie Kennedy kid being friends with all the, the hot, cool kids yeah, on the screen. wouldn't have happened. Very unrealistic. These kids in, uh, in A Nightmare on Elm Street seem to kind of have their situation, and this Rod guy doesn't really fit in. They're not wearing leather jackets carrying around knives. He's either he below just them watched, or above them. He just them watched or, like the Thriller video and was like, "I'm gonna dress like Michael Jackson." You said thriller. that you were like the Michael Jackson guy, and I was like, "There's a Michael Jackson guy." I he didn't see lo- that at all. He looks like Michael Jackson. He was more. Did you have you seen Grease? Yes. He was more Danny Zuko to me. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's accurate. He too, was actually like a darker a darker haired Kaniki. Kaniki was a little more. I don't uh, know. There was wild there child. was one scene. The scene where uh, where Rod gets arrested is one the funniest scene of all time. Yeah, they arrest it him is, because after because she dies after they have sex. Nightmare on Elm Street like really brought home a lot of the like bad rap things that that uh, that horror movies get. The old school slashers like the horrible acting is this is like one of the worst acted movies of all time. This probably has the worst acting of all the things we saw. Absolutely. Not and even I'll, close. I'll not remind close. you that we watched an episode of Dawson's Creek. Yes. Continue. <laughs> um, the acting was awful. The, uh, the silly running was very prominent in this Ooh, movie. Yeah. Just really, really silly running. This really laid the groundwork for taken just and, uh, yeah, <laughs> Which really it set the new bar, right? Yeah, I was gonna say it, as they in the do, modern age. Yeah, like like I wouldn't. Wa- I was thinking of watching a lot of these movies have modern remakes. Obviously, Halloween, but like I feel like a Nightmare on Elm Street did a lot of these. Uh, There's a lot more Jason movies, and I was thinking of watching one of the more modern ones, but I didn't want to because I know that a remake of 
the old one will be a lot scarier because they can just juice everything up and do crazier things. So similarly, Taken is a remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street (laughs) running-wise, and the awful running is on beefed up a thousand percent. They got all sorts of tricks they can pull. Yeah, uh, yeah. Their running was so bad. Uh, like the the stupid decisions were very very prominent uh, in this movie as well. So this one like really brought uh, like to light why these stereotypes exist sure. for the movies. Uh, a big issue I had was the mu- This was the movie that had the the worst music for me. It was uh, the movie came out in 1984. You mentioned Thriller. Uh, this was, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, let's see, Off the Wall was 1980. Let me see when Thriller came out. Uh, this was, uh, 1982 was Thriller. So this movie is clearly... So that checks out. Like, the yeah. guy just watched Thriller and is trying to be This thriller. soundtrack is very influenced by, like, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson stuff. And that does not work. Like, the Exorcist theme song is... Very eerie. The Halloween theme song is very eerie. Both of these songs are, uh, well, they're, I guess they're all instrumental, but they really play around with time signatures, so you can't really tell what the song is doing, and you don't really know like what, like where the downbeat is or whatever. So it's just, it's just a good, light way to kind of disillusion you. Nightmare on Elm Street is just straight going for Michael Jackson sounding stuff. So it's like big drums and like big synthy stuff. And it's like makes you want to party, yeah. like like if you walked into one of these chase scenes in these dreams, you'd be like, "Oh, what are we doing?" Well, that's how Freddy Krueger gets you. He oh, lures in the kids with like a dance party. He plays a cool <laughs> dance party. So this this <laughs> movie was hey, later see a trick, and he becomes a party clown. And then what do you know? You're this getting later it. was this movie was later uh, remade in 2019, and it was called Ma. <laughs> <You got it. laughs> They just use like there are there are parallels there. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so that, that that's that's an example of the music really being a, a negative, where music can be a major major part of these horror movies. Uh, so it ends up being about this main character whose name I forget. What's her name? She she stinks. She's a very bad actress. Maybe she, she became is. a good one. No, there's absolutely she was no not way. yet a good. You actress. can't you can't rebound from how bad of a performance that was. There's no way. Uh, a Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, what was her name? I don't know. At any rate, she keeps falling asleep, and he keeps coming back to her. And her dad is a cop, Nancy. So Nancy, and they figure, you know what? We'll be able to figure out what's going on here, right? And her mom's being all weird about it. But the girl is determined to get to the bottom of this, and she says, and her mom's like, fall asleep, fall asleep. So she's like, yo, mom, what are you, you in on this? Why are you trying to get me to fall asleep? <laughs> There's a terrible scene right after they arrest Rod in the police station between the mom and the daughter. I forget what they're talking about, but at, some, at one point, one of them... And these are the two worst actors alive. Again, you want to know what they're talking about? What it, uh, they're talking about uh, drowning in the bathtub because half of this movie oh, no, was no, spent no. To, about talking about how many people drown in bathtubs per year. That's true. And they inflate the numbers like crazy. That's true. They're, the mom's like, listen, be careful in there. 487 people die per year by Did drowning you know? in the bathtub. Did you she's know? like, what are you, the fucking Guinness Book of World one Records? In eight, one in eight people die. From drowning in the bathtub. So anyway, the, this whole family sucks. And the, the father is like the worst cop in the world. Oh, I, you know, on my notes is uh, he's the worst cop in the world. And he cares about his family absolutely zero. Zero percent. Zero percent. So I was going to first point out that this girl falls asleep very easily, which she does. She says to her dad, uh, she's in the house by herself while everybody's trying to get to the bottom of what's going on here. And it seems like you might want to be keeping an eye on her. She's in the home by herself, and or I guess her mom is falling asleep. And she says to her dad, come in 20 minutes, then I'll be asleep and you can catch him. And in 20 minutes, she has enough time to not only fall asleep, but first booby trap her entire house, <laughs> Home Alone style. If you were to tell me, I, hey, I wrote down Home Alone, like... I wrote down that when the fuck did she become an engineer slash like Home Alone? It's ridiculous. It's, it's like... In the eighties, did they did people just think that like children were engineers and just could make booby traps from anything? She was like reading terrorist cookbooks halfway through that movie too. If you were to tell me you have fall do you have twenty minutes to fall asleep, 
and you're tired and you're very calm, I know there would be no way I could fall asleep in 20 minutes. Yeah. Let alone as soon as you plan the, the idea. When the stakes are high, right? She's like, "Hey, I am going to. I am determined now to go fall asleep." She's not popping any. <laughs> she's not popping any sleeping aids or she did, melatonin. Uh, or she what? did install a coffee maker right next to her bed, which I thought was a a nice little move. Did you catch that? No. <laughs> yeah, she just like she put a coffee maker right on her nightstand and was just sipping that coffee when and when she was trying to stay awake. It was very funny. But, yeah, Classic. I mean, as soon as you plant the idea that, like, hey, you got to fall asleep in 20 minutes, you're not fall asleep in, falling asleep in 20 minutes. As soon as you have to think about, like, falling asleep, you're not going to fall asleep. Yeah. So this girl's dad, stupidest cop in the world. All of her friends are dying, and he will not keep an eye on her. <laughs> she screams out of the window. This is 20 minutes after all that happened where she's like, yo, be here in 20 minutes, and you got him. I'm going to get him trapped. Just be here in 20 minutes. And he's like, I, don't know, I gotta figure out why that kid was listening to headphones on the record player. I think we're, this, this is more important to us, or something. He's working on something way less important, and uh, so she screams out of the window at him. This is across the street. She screams, "Help! I've got him trapped!" And from across the street, he stays standing there and yells back, "Everything is under control." She's like setting the house on fire, <laughs> doing all these crazy things to catch him, and he refuses to go in and get her. Then there's a death scene with the mom, and he that's kind of where the movie loses me. I'm like, yeah, I don't care about her either. I don't care about Call her. Call me the but dad like, because the, I don't care. Yeah, the dad did not care one bit that his wife just died right in front of his eyes. He watches her sink into the bed, disappear, and he's like, eh. Yeah. All right. That's that's fine. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, the worst cop of all time. Also, I I, uh, I wrote that like I, I don't really understand Freddy Krueger. I don't understand like what the rules around him are. Totally, and they leave that very vague and ambiguous. And I don't know if I don't I don't I'm, I'm hesitant to criticize that because like one, again, there's mystery around a guy and he's just capable of anything. I think that makes it a little bit more scary. Mm -hmm. And also because he like lives in dreams and dreams are fucking weird and there are no rules for dreams really. Yeah, it's that makes sense. I think it all ends up uh, boiling over and reaching a fever pitch with Nancy deciding you're not real if i don't believe in you and folks i can hear your eyes rolling all of ours are some of them are covered by warby parker shouts out them that move of the bad guy doesn't believe exist if i don't believe in them all it does is prove everybody the entire movie right for saying to you you're imagining this. <laughs> right. This is all in your – you're not well. And they're like – and you, the viewer, are like, these adults aren't listening to the kids. It's real. Like this happens in It as well. And it's like, yeah. like you're, no, you, you just got to listen to them. Well, shame on fucking me for listening to you, you <laughs> stupid kid. It wasn't real. <laughs> right. Are you, you kidding could, me? You could have saved like a million lives had you come to this conclusion an hour and a half ago. Totally. So – that's how that ends. It's so fucking lame. Stupid. They all then at the end they all everybody's okay. The mom's still alive. All of her friends are alive. They get into a convertible, and the top comes up, and it's red and green, like Freddie Merc uh, Freddie Mercury, Freddie Mercury yes. like Freddie Krueger, and then the mom dies again. And I'm like, at that point, I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, at, uh, really, like honestly, at you that point, lost me like five times in a row. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I uh, I couldn't care to to figure out what why that happened. What it means, uh, I, I guess now I know that it means that we're spawning 95 sequels. Yeah. But uh, this one didn't do it for me. I really think this is the worst of the bunch. A Nightmare on Elm Street can, it was really, a very stupid can really go to hell. I'll, I'll, do, I'll take the A Nightmare on Elm Street over The Exorcist because it is shorter. And there's more stuff you can laugh at. Yeah, that's fair. Like I'm, I'm, more, uh, I'm more likely to rewatch Nightmare on Elm Street because, like, one... It's not not as tough to get through. It's not as a sl not much of a slog to get through. There are like the things that you can laugh at if you yeah. watch it with somebody else or something. Um, the Exorcist sucks, dude. It's it's better the first time through. Yeah, I I'm, no, I'm saying like compared to Nightmare on Elm Street. Like I went through Nightmare on Elm Street being like, wow, this movie fucking sucks. Wow, I, I got through The Exorcist not not thinking that. All right, I'm excited for this one. We're gonna take a trip to the '90s. For Scream. Now, devotees of brunch will remember some 
some not on the same pageism of Happy Death Day when we saw that. And ultimately, Randy and I realized or we diagnosed Pete not loving it as much as us as being due to the fact that you had not seen Scream. Right. And so much of like Happy Death Day doesn't totally ape Scream, but a lot of it is I feel like it just makes no sense. And none of the, the appealing parts are appealing if you haven't if you didn't have this groundwork of this absurdly crazy, weird slasher film. They really brought back slasher films. Not like the nineties I feel like horror movies died for a little bit and people there was no buzz about them. And then this they came with Scream and it was like a big box office success and it had hot, cool people in it. Nev Campbell, what a babe. Oh yeah. It was still ro- a babe. Ro- always love Nev Campbell. Rose McGowan, who is uh who was like kind of an it girl back in the day. She really like Jamie paved Kennedy. the way. <laughs> yeah, Jamie Kennedy. But uh, Scream is fucking incredible. Yes, I was. I I was not expecting that at all. Rewatching it, and I saw all of them when I was a kid. I didn't realize I love this movie. This movie is. I expected it to be a uh, a very dumb, like very bad sort of uh, goofy. Not not goofy, but like. I just, mean, it's it's corny, it's silly, it's got ridiculous but it characters, but it's so got self-aware. Some, yes, and so I get where I get like that's how you kind of got uh, Happy Death Day, mm-hmm. but like uh, Scream is much more like overt about it. Yeah, about like we get it because it references a Ton bunch of, of horror other movie things. References, yeah, tons of horror movie references. Uh, so this was made by Wes Craven, who also made A Nightmare on Elm Street. He was uh he was real hot shit back in the nineties. I, I he was probably the only director I knew by name in the nineties. Like okay. more so than like Martin Scorsese or anybody big. He was like the the it guy because he was making Scream. I think he also made I Know What You Did Last Summer. I think I I love I that movie wrong. too. That was the, that is the movie that scared me the most as a kid. Really, that terrified me. I mean, that is a really really great one, and it it, it does have like it might be scarier than a lot of these. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Scream gets off to an incredible start. Oh yeah, it that's is an, such a good start. One of the, I would say, probably one of the most iconic movie opening scenes of any genre. That is just gets you, right into I it. Never forget it, Drew Barrymore, because there was a lot of talk. But so Drew Barrymore, if you guys haven't seen Scream, really go fuck yourselves. <laughs> like this, <laughs> n- not a like. Well, now that I'm in to that... get through this, like if you haven't seen Scream, you guys lived through. My what you you could probably hear and feel my disappointment and anger at Pete when I realized that he hadn't seen Scream. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen Scream by now, come on, go see Scream. But uh, uh, Wes Craven did not do. I know you did last summer. That was Jim Gillespie. Uh, Anyways, but Kevin Williamson yes, did correct. do that one. Yes. Uh, but yeah, the the there was a lot of talk back then because the opening scene was so iconic. Uh, Drew Barrymore getting the phone call. They kill her boyfriend, then they kill her. What's your favorite scary movie? I'm gonna get you like a fish, et cetera, et cetera. She was on the movie poster and on the cover of the really? movie. Really? She was the she's the fir- the main person on the That's awesome. Scream movie poster, and people were like, "Yo, you sold us a bill of goods." Because Drew Barrymore was huge back right. then, so they were like, "Wait, this movie's got Drew Barrymore, this hot girl Nev Campbell, <laughs> Rose McGowan, Courtney Cox, Skeet Ulrich." Matthew Lillard before <laughs> Scooby Doo, Henry Winkler. This goes at David Arquette, where he's gonna meet Courtney Cox, leading to a very classic opening credits of uh, Friends? Friends. Yes, man, <laughs> all this stuff—it's got so much crazy stuff. But you're gonna you're gonna lie to us and act like this is a Drew Barrymore movie, so people were mad back then. I love it. I love it. I I think that's a great move to pull. It's, it's better g- than doing the. Uh, it's better than doing the Kingsman. Hey, uh, Channing Tatum's in this movie, and then only putting him in for like fifteen minutes, and not I because do that he dies. All the time. When I'm trying to get brunch guests, I'm like, hey, does your client want to come on this podcast that has Miles Teller sometimes? <laughs> yeah. Like Miles Teller didn't even know that he was on brunch. I know, I love it. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was. I thought that was great. I, I'm stunned at how much that I like Scream, and also that like. How disappointed I am and everybody else for letting me get it, get away with not seeing it for so long. I know that you pushed it on me, yeah. but Scream is thrown into like the horror genre 
and it, it doesn't it doesn't stand out like when people talk about about like horror movies they talk about Nightmare on Elm Street they talk about Halloween they talk about Friday the 13th Scream is better than all of those movies it's not you're right it's not in that um, well it's like it's like new Christmas songs if you recorded a Christmas song within the last 15 20 years no shot that's getting added it's true they they just decided they closed up shop that catalog that annual rotation of songs that are played around Christmas time really you don't even hear like, this gift by 98 degrees. They shut the door after Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. And that wasn't that long after uh, All I Want for Christmas is You. Really, they were like, we are done. No <laughs> new submissions. And the horror classics I guess group did that too. Yeah, I guess it's like uh, it, I guess it's like the horror classics built the house. If you're good enough to live in it, just be happy with that. Yeah. With like some of these newer movies. But man, I think that's kind of bullshit. Scream is better than any of those movies. Scream is maybe like the best horror movie. That I best slasher that I think I've ever seen. Yeah, I might enjoy. Come to think of it, I might enjoy uh, Scream more than Halloween. Yeah. Halloween is like Halloween's like the Beatles, where it's just like it. When you think of music and you think of pop bands, that's just what it is. That's like the OG, so you have so much respect for it. Yeah. But some things might come along that you like more than that. I will say. Uh, I think what Scream did is more impressive than what Halloween did because Scream had like those predecessors to yeah. live up to and it found a way to be different and it found a way to like reference them and do it in a way that is like they made a great slasher, but they also made it fucking hilarious. Yeah. Scream. What, what Scream did was took a horror movie and in the bottom right hand corner of the screen slapped an MTV logo on it. Yes. Right? Yeah, like it, yeah. it was it was so so in nineteen ninety six. It was so nice. I, right. Like I cannot impress upon you how TRL that movie is. <laughs> and I I can't really put it into words. Well but you can. Just, Matthew Lillard. It, right. <laughs> it, it just has like the ultimate nineties feel. And it's it's terrific. It uh, feels like a it well it, at at a lot of points it feels like a parody of a lot of the movies that came before it but it nods, stands nods on its winks. own legs yeah uh so i first saw this when i was a kid it came out in 96 i was born in 88 so i realized i probably didn't see it when i was eight i probably saw it when i was 10 or something like that and watching it as an adult when they show the boyfriend at first it is the most obvious that guy's probably the killer moment <laughs> yeah. in anything it was also a very obvious, like, hey, they, they cast that guy to be Johnny Depp. Right. He's got, right, a lot of, really in horror movies, if someone's got a lot of character in their face, that guy's They killing. did it. <laughs> that guy <laughs> is killing. And this guy, Skeet Ulrich, I apologize if I am, uh, it could be Ulrich. Don't know if he's got a Metallica relation or what, but he's, uh, he's got a lot, a lot of character, a lot of, like, he's got a real twisted look about him. Handsome. But like a real twisted look about him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he comes in, and you should know right then and there, like, all right, this guy's the killer. He is one of the killers. And uh, I'll tell you, horniness level on this movie, 10 out of 10. Astounding. 10 out of 10. (laughs) We're going to get to some stuff that moves past 10 out of 10, but it is a 10 out of 10. Her mother died. Her mother was killed. Uh, her, Her mother was... Nev Campbell's mother in this movie is uh, was raped and butchered, to use the term, and uh, Cotton Weary was charged for it. Yeah, Leif Schreiber, when criminally uh, yeah. underused. In uh, right this movie. of all the right, that's right of all the people I just named. Leif, but you know what? He's got he had some real David Harbor to him back in the day, where like you could get him. He didn't have a lot. He was in everything. He yeah. like had small little parts, and he was just a stupid guy that they put in stuff. And then one day they realized, you know who rules? Leif Shriver. I wonder if he had like a bigger, was originally like had a bigger role in that movie, like in the script or something, because he doesn't have a single line. And in Deputy the movie. Dewey just stole so many scenes. They were like, dude, <laughs> sorry, Leif, we gotta. But it's like you cast a guy with the best voice of all time, and you didn't give him a Easy line. There, but he's got he's got a great voice. He's got an unbelievable got voice. A great voice. Uh, so I think they could have they could have cast anybody in that role. They picked Leif Schreiber. They and have, didn't let him speak. They have a lot of fun with names in this movie. You know what Billy's last name is? No, Loomis. There's Ooh. a nod. Okay, 
Dr. Loomis, Halloween. Okay, okay, okay. There's all sorts of... There's, there's a couple of Halloween references. One of the big scenes in this movie is while they're watching Halloween, and Jamie Kennedy's Seth Green ass is uh, breaking all Dude, that his is so... Rules. It's so fucking funny. Yeah. Uh, where he's... Where he... The, where he says... Uh, Jamie, look out, because Jamie Lee Curtis, right. his name is also Jamie. Very annoying that he keeps calling her Jamie. If he's as big a fan as he claims to be, he's saying Lori. Mm-hmm. Okay. That yeah, was one of my true. notes. That's true. Uh, but I, I loved the, uh, just like, Jamie, look out. Wow. Horniness, it's very good. Horniness off the charts in this. Uh, he has Billy and, and Sydney are dating. Mm-hmm. Sydney is Nev Campbell. And uh, she has intimacy issues because of the death of her mother, so she's not having sex with her boyfriend. You know what they call that? What's that? Sexually anorexic. That is one of the things, right? She is very, very hard on herself. She says at one point, uh, sorry, I was in my Dawson's Creek notes, which were way too long. (laughs) She says, how many guys, she said, Billy's, she's saying that Billy's being a real champ. She says, how many guys would want to put up with a girl Who's sexually anorexic? I'm like, man, Sydney, you've been through stuff, and right. everybody seems to understand. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh man, like whatever you need, however you need to cope, whatever. But he almost like he almost breaks up with her in like the first scene. He climbs into the window, and he's like, he's looking for I something. F- he's quite horny. Yes, and he is like, I feel like, I feel like we were we were NC seventeen when we first started, and now, now. It, we're, we're PG, and maybe maybe we need so to go to in different ways. So are we to think that they ways. were having sex before and yeah. they stopped having sex? Yeah. Okay, because otherwise, there's a lot of that going on in this movie, too. Like, uh, characters talking about how much they may or may not have had sex. Uh, Sean pulls that in hilarious fashion in the Boy Meets World oh, episode. Yes. They're all going yes. around <laughs> saying, hey, uh, the, the virgin virgins live in horror movies, yes. and a bunch of them are like, well, I guess I'm going to die. And Sean's like... I'm going to get as sick as you can without dying. <laughs> so good. Kind of hilarious. Yeah. It's like, I've done most stuff. <laughs> Classic high school Sean. Uh, anyway, so this scene, this was one of the big things that stood out to me. Uh, Billy comes in early in the movie, and he wants to make out with Sydney. He asks if they can do some... Uh, what do you say? Over the clothes stuff. Over the clothes stuff. So it's like really, it's like a really delicate sexual scene. And then he immediately goes for under the clothes stuff. And then, right. But as this scene is happening, I didn't realize when I saw this as a kid, a, a an extremely sensual rendition of Don't Fear the Reaper is playing, <laughs> which is just the most amazing, beautiful thing in the world. I legitimately looked up who's responsible for this. How does this exist? I've been, I've been legitimately, the last two days, I've been trading DMs with the guy who produced... And recorded this version. If you haven't heard it, listen to it. It will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. This is highly sexual stuff. And it is Don't Fear the Reaper. Which I, I'm i so interested in this. Reached out to him. Asked if he could come on. He couldn't today. But he's either going to send us something. Or talk to us for a second. Just explaining how that happened. Because... That is really that was like my biggest takeaway of this rewatch of uh, uh, of Scream. So k- keep an eye on on that going forward. Deputy Dewey. Oh man, uh, my where to no- begin? Right, so the toughest thing about this movie for me was that I had seen uh, the scary movie, scary yes. movie two, before I saw this one. Or is it regular scary movie? Regular scary movie. Regular they scary take movie. Deputy Dewey and uh, make him mentally challenged yes. and call him Deputy Doofy. Yes. File under. Absolutely not. <laughs> right. But having seen that before seeing this movie, I could not get uh, Deputy Doofy out of my head, and I just had to view it through that lens, and it was it was tough. Like, they, if memory know. serves, they make Deputy Doofy look a lot like Deputy Dewey. Yes. And just really only his speech is different. And uh, I don't know, man. As soon as, like, the, like, I didn't n- fully get it, until like I think they maybe went overboard until I got to the fucking ice cream scene. I was like, why is he eating an ice cream yeah. while having a serious conversation with his superior? And then I was like, now I understand why they did that in scary movie. Let me tell you, uh, Tatum, his sister, yes, is absolutely her whole thing is like, 
Dewey, you suck. You're such a loser. Oh my God, you're embarrassing me in, all my fr- in front of all my friends. I hate you so much, Dewey. She is so in the wrong because she's doing all of this like in front of his superiors. Yes. If someone, ca- if someone I knew came to my work, it was like, God, DJ, I hate you so much. You're such a loser. God, I'm like, you can't, you cannot do that. Right. You've got to leave. You've got to get out of here. Yeah. Tatum is in the wrong, not yeah. Dewey. She is a bully. She's horrible to him. Yeah. Uh, and he he's like a nice guy. He's, yeah, he's he well intentioned. Like, yeah, he does all the all the right things. He's just kind of like a he's a little uh, aloof, I would right. say. Uh, then there's Gail Weathers, who is the tabloid and TV reporter slash author. She's slash, got her iron. slash like TV show host. Yeah, she's got her iron in uh, quite a few different fires. A lot of people are like a lot of them I are love your show. Related. Yeah, like I love your show, but like she's a news reporter reporting from the field. But and she calls her. She was like, "I'm a tabloid." She's like, "Do you think a tabloid reporter like me could ever?" I'm like, "What do you do? (laughs) Is is any of this getting sent back to the station?" Yeah, she's like an entrepreneur of news. Oh yeah, she's she's just trying to attack it from every angle. She's getting she's trying starting to up a website. She's trying to secure her capital. Right. She's early on in the, the blogging she, she game. She's got investors. Whole thing. But she is such an asshole. Very yes. mean to Kenny. Uh, she has like one suit and it's bright yellow. Mm. And that way that like you know that she has one suit because you take notice of it the first time you see it and then you see her every other time and she's still wearing that same suit and you're like damn. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be more successful so you can get another not neon yellow suit. She's got her classic line. To her cameraman, Kenny. Kenny, I know you're 50 pounds overweight, but no, Gail. No, Courtney. Why don't you demand... Can't you just have it written in that your character isn't the worst person in the world? I think she might have it written in that her character has to be the worst person in the world. It's a real juxtaposition because there are a few people more uh, lovely looking and worse behaving than... <laughs> right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a real mind, real mind bang. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed that uh, that they had the Freddy Krueger janitor. Yeah, that was very uh, very nice. I like that. Um, yeah, there was just like a lot of little details that were 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 cool to me, and like it was uh, very 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 referential. And uh, I liked. I know we don't necessarily always love the referential stuff, mm. but I enjoyed it in this case. The nods and winks. Yeah, they're quite good. It's uh, you talked about the self awareness of this movie. They have a big party while everybody's getting killed, and it leaves the viewer with the thought. I'd even forgot that Jamie Kennedy ends up saying this, and I wrote it down. Like, you can't have parties when there's a serial killer. Like the two, I wrote the two rules of living in community with a serial killer: no parties and no sex. Right. And then Jamie Kennedy gives up and g- gets up and gives that speech. Maybe it was in my still in my subconscious from having seen the movie before, but he gets up and gives that speech. He was like, "Here are the things you can't do." Uh, in a horror movie. He doesn't say when there's a serial killer. Because if he did, he would probably realize, I should probably leave this party. Right. He says, you can't, what does he say? Uh, don't do drugs, don't drink, and don't have sex. Yes. And, like, that's all anybody there is doing. That leads to the uh, iconic scene in which Tatum is killed. Where she goes to the garage to get some beers and tries to run out through the, what's that called? A cat flap? A uh, cat door. Cat door. And then the killer uh, opens up the garage, which, to Tatum's dismay, is the only garage in the world that doesn't immediately stop (laughs) when there's a sign of anything. You could put – someone could throw a pebble five miles away from, like, my parents' garage door while it's opening or closing, and it will stop. Right. And it will, like, look around and wait five minutes and be like, everybody good? All right, let's continue. (laughs) I was also, like – I was also trying to figure out, and it took me too long to figure out whether it would actually like kill her if it was. Go- I don't think that it would, it would kill her. I don't know if it would. It either. would take too much force. Yeah, and she just died immediately. So it was. Uh, it was very confusing. That's a. That's a real. That that's one of those deaths where you're like, man, you get out of that. Yeah, she she could have easily wiggled her way out of that door. Right. Or it wouldn't have killed her. It would have taken too long. But you know what? It was a great death. A great death scene. Yeah. And R.I.P. Tatum. That was you she sent, was only 19. I was very happy. You sent me a screen grab of that and said, man, she was only 19. Quite good. Now, this isn't a new movie. You're probably wondering, where are all Pete's jokes? These are old movies. 
That's true. Pete only Pete only does only a tight do five. five. Yeah. Pete only does a tight five when we see new movies. What if you did have to instead of just like me making you write a couple jokes? If I required five minutes of of stand up material, please. I would get like thirty five seconds through it, and then I would panic and run away. Be like, ah, uh, you'd be one of the. You ever see a comedian who's like, what else? What else? <laughs> yeah. That's the worst. I always feel so bad. Yeah. And they like, they have like a note, their notepad with them. You got to, you got to, whether it's mnemonic devices, whatever, got to be able to do that. You got to be able to raw dog your material, man. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't know if I could do it, but we'll see because you're going to have to in the future movies that we see. Uh, so, uh, that's the end of my notes, but I know there's so much more. What else, uh, what else stood out to you in this, in this film? Yeah, honestly, I kind of just wrote down like general observations and, and not, uh, I don't think there's like really any. It ends up being uh, Skeet Ulrich and uh, and Matthew Lillard, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I don't have too many notes on like the actual plot of the of the movie. Like I, I I didn't see the the ending coming in terms of it being two people. I liked that move. Yeah, I did too. Because it's very different. telegraphed when you look back in the beginning after uh, Drew Barrymore's character died. They're sitting around being like, "Hey, someone was murdered. So obviously, it has to be someone at our school." Which person from our school did it? When in reality, it's like, could be anybody. Right. And uh, Matthew Lillard says, I didn't kill anybody. And Skeet Ulrich looks at him with pretty heavy eyes and says, nobody said that you did. As if to be like, mm, shut up. You're, you're going to blow our cover. Right. Why are you, why are you making, why are you putting that, that thought in people's minds, bro? Stick to putting knives in people's minds <laughs> like we do. And they pounded it. And they were like, that gesture doesn't exist <laughs> yet and it seems you two are openly talking about how you're the ones that are killing everybody but i, that, uh, I, I like that it ended up being those two that it's a it's a classic little twist yeah i didn't have any problem with it i i i didn't like that uh the the father yeah. was the most useless human in the world yeah he served no purpose in that movie other That's than a just recurring going theme away in movies <laughs> yeah. recurring theme yeah but at least like at least the the father in Nightmare on Elm Street had a role in the movie. Yeah, this father was just like no need for him to be there. The Nightmare on Elm Street da- dad was there to fuck things up. Yeah, the the scream dad was just there, not doing anything. Even when he was like lying on the the floor of the kitchen, could have could have taken a an active role in diffusing the situation. Even though he was kind of tied up. Yeah, but he he made no effort, zero effort. I'll say it makes no sense that these two were the killers they had no motive nope they were asked why'd you do it why'd you kill my mom and they said what'd they say they were like because your mom was a slut and everyone knows it she was flashing her stuff all over town like is this the exorcist (laughs) with this 1973 judgment (laughs) i'm sorry i don't even i hate that i just said that word and i'm pretty glad that, that that word is pretty gone but what? That is why you. Well, he also said that she has. Uh, her her mom was sexually active. Yeah, oh, right. She sleeps with his dad, and that's why his mom left. Oh, that's true. Okay. And, and also, like a. But bi- there's stuff about like she was flashing everybody all over town. I'm like, hey, I don't think she was just like going around flashing people. That doesn't sound realistic. Also, you didn't have a problem when Sydney flashed you in the beginning. Of the I, was movie, tough say, guy. I was gonna say. I was gonna say, horny like, dog. Wait a year, you're legal. You can cash in on that, horn boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Scream, uh, unbelievable. Scream, Loved it. a classic. We're going to follow up. I'm seriously going to let you guys know. If I get any uh, new information on that rendition of Don't Fear the Reaper, because so I'm many excited. questions. Ooh. So many questions. Uh, let's stay in the 90s, get to another horror classic. And then there was Sean, a season five episode of Boy Meets World. I, be- uh, I believe so. 1998. In this movie, in this film, Topanga and Corey have just broken up. And Sean is taking it horribly. Very horribly. And another recurring theme of these horror movies is a lot of stuff doesn't make sense. Don't get why Sean is being such a freak about this. But he's really, he's really acting out. Well, uh, Corey and Topanga are Sean's parents. That's true. He, and he says, like, you two have been together since before I, I knew you. Right. And if I don't and if I don't know you together, then I guess I don't know anything. And I'm like, Sean, with all due respect, 
There have been five seasons of this show, and all they have done is establish. You don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is you not are breaking the news. stupidest character on the show, and Eric Matthews is on this show. <laughs> so if this is you, if this is what what it took for you to realize, you know, I'm not the I'm not the sharpest cheese in the on the plate on the charcuterie board, then maybe so be it. Maybe, maybe it was needed. If right. it was needed, so this was a uh, it's a real thriller episode. They get detention because they're acting up. And the door is locked, and there's some stuff written on the the uh, chalkboard. It says, nobody gets out alive. A kid who asked Panga for a pencil dies, and then one by one, they start dropping off. The best the best line of that that uh, entire show. We'll always know that he was this tall. That so was good. So great, yeah. <laughs> so, so, a kid, uh, so a kid's standing against uh, the, uh, the, the wall. And it's one of those classic, someone standing up, and they slowly fall down because they're dead. And you didn't know when you first looked at them, they were dead. But this kid has, like, a pencil in his head, <laughs> so you're pretty sure he's dead. And then he falls down, dragging the pencil with it. Corey walks over and says, well, I always know he was this tall. So good. Very good. Incorrect. The pencil was not at the top <laughs> yeah, of his head. It was, in, it was in the middle of his forehead. It's like, we'll always know he was five inches taller than this. And it was a straight line down, so... Congrats to that kid for dying in the most uh, kid didn't have a way drop possible. of scoliosis. <laughs> that kid was that kid had balance. It was terrific. Want to hear the absolute worst uh, episode description that I've ever seen in my life? Sure. It's for this show, for this episode, and it's on uh, on Wiki. When you Google it, Sean turns his attention to a new girl. Right. In parentheses, Jennifer Love Hewitt at school. Yes, I did see that. That was the description when I watched it on demand. Is that they intentionally just to, misleading? Yes, they okay. had to put in there that uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt is in the episode. And she is in it. She makes a cameo in which she makes up with Eric uh, heavily. And it maybe did not, not seem okay. Yeah, maybe not w- like with her in- intentions. I it was that, that jumped her. That's just like classic 90s. Not or really anything pre now, not considering like, that there are two sides right. to everything. So Eric Matthews sees this beautiful girl, Jennifer Love Hewitt, walks up to her, no questions asked, throws his arms around her and starts making out with her. And she makes out with him back and they're kissing and they're both into it. But unless there was like a scene earlier in the show where they got to know each other, and there was a little flirtation. I'm not saying that you need to know somebody for 10 years before you start kissing. But they were but very need... clear in that episode. They were like, we've never seen this yes, girl before. Yes, there needs to be some sort of like, hey, both sides are into this before it begins. Right. And that doesn't happen. No. So they, uh, her name, she plays somebody named uh, Jennifer Love Pfeffernan. Yep. And she dies because they go into the library to find out who the killer is, and... A uh, bunch of books are pushed onto Jennifer Love Hewitt, which is enough to kill her. And when you think, that's probably not enough to kill her. More books fall onto Eric, killing him as well. Well, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Uh, well, I mean, you seen John Wick three? That's true. Mm. Just saying, books are deadly. Don't uh, read. The biggest thing that uh, two things stood out to me. This followed the thing that happens in Scream with uh, Jamie Kennedy's character. Every horror movie has a character who talks about how much they know about horror movies. Yep. And Sean is the one in this episode. He's like, oh, it can't be this guy because now blah, 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 blah. And it's like, dude, if you're in a real life situation where like people are dying and getting killed, if you are applying <laughs> Kevin Williamson's like <laughs> musings to this... You are an idiot. You're an asshole if you're just like flexing, if you're taking the opportunity with to people flex dying your to pop flex culture your knowledge. own pop culture knowledge. Which, by the way, totally something I would do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I would sure. be like, man, that's eerie. <laughs> kind of like the intro to this song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is 100% you. Uh, um, yeah, I, have, uh, I don't have many notes on this episode. Well, the biggest thing like, is that, like this is dated more than any of the other things because uh, every time somebody dies... Eric yells, oh, my God, you killed blank, you, and then there's a noise to get in the way. This is a reference to the early episodes of South Park. Yeah. This was around when South Park was happening, seemingly. Because back then, all anybody ever said was, oh, my God, you killed blank, you bastard. And the first kid who died was named Kenny. Kenny. So. And they move on to, oh, my God, you killed Feeney, you bastard. Now, this ends up being all a dream. 
Classic. <laughs> they should have. Uh, they should have had it been all a dream, and then Freddy Krueger kills uh, Sean while he's dreaming it. Kind of. Ho- this was. This was kind of horny. Um, Eric, super horny. Yeah, definitely. That's about it, though. Yep. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, Corey and Topanga are always Corey, horny. Corny thanks Topanga for never having sex with him. Yes, yeah. Uh, but Corey, I, I think that that's not. It's it's tough to say that that counts as horny because that's just who Corey's character is. That's true. He's like he's a, horny throughout the entire. He's got run. a young Ray to him. <laughs> yes, but I mean, the ending to this, the Boy Meets World one, was so stupid, and it was stupid when I first saw it. Where it's Sean is the uh, is the one who's hunting them, and yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Oh yeah, really. yeah. The reveal ends up being they see the killer and they take off his mask, and it's Sean, and it's because he's sad that Corey and Topanga aren't together. I'm like, man, you said that five times in the beginning. We know <laughs> yeah. you're sad that Corey and Topanga aren't together. I do like what's uh, what's his name, Matthew Lawrence. Is he the... Uh, I think so. One of the Lawrence things. I do like that he tries to kill himself because he can't afford his rent. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. That's funny. Yeah, what? Eric dies, and he's like, yes, that he's guy... Like, he's like, I can't afford my rent now, and he just runs to the to jump yeah. out the window of the library. <laughs> Angela putting on a tour de force with a screaming. Yeah, like, literally the only thing she does in that episode. She, she has Useless. that scream down. She has that scream down. All right, let's get to... Uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> Halloween candy. It's a 1998 episode, season three. This is back when the pizza place still existed, where they were using that Nemo's. as kind of the Nemo's. They were using that as the their Cheers, their central perk, their kind of home base, their uh, their other set. Which I'm glad Raymond got away from. Yes. Like man, when you've got a situation as good as all these people sitting in Ray's living room, why would you? ever go any place else yeah and i think like part of why everybody loves raymond worked is that it's so contained and like you could see ray every going episode's fucking a bottle crazy episode. yeah and so uh them escaping there and also just the fact that they just torture that waitress yes <laughs> every time they're at nemo's big horn boys yes all right uh this is the horniest episode of everybody loves raymond ever this is the horniest episode of television anything. ever anything it's a horny halloween it is the literally the entire episode is nonstop horny. Right out the gate, it opens on Raymond explaining a fantasy to Deborah in which he's a pilot cramping up, and a stewardess takes off her clothes and begins to rub his shoulder. No bigger horn boy than Ray. And this was before I wrote that before I knew that this whole episode was a horn fest. You right. know, like usually there's like a cold open, something that's that's unrelated from the rest of the episode. Yeah, a fun little thing that sets up. Hey, these are some crazy characters. Let's see what they got themselves into. No. This starts with like, hey, Deborah, I want to have sex. This is what I'm thinking about. So Ray and Deborah are going to have sex. They reveal in this episode, I kind of like this. They reveal that uh, Ray and Deborah are hashtag condom gang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big condom users. But, but Shouts I, out to them practicing not only safe sex, but making sure that no other kids have Ray as a father. Yeah, they practice safe sex by not having it. That's true. Um, Abstinence, bro. <laughs> yeah. But no, like in the first scene. Sexual they, anorexia. It, it was very not clear. I don't think that they were talking about condoms. They were talking about they were looking for like a tube or something. It was like a cream or something. Oh, really? And I was like, do they have a do they have Spermicide, birth Some like spermicidal cream? Is that what it Gel, was? Spermicidal like lube or whatever? I don't know. I have no idea. And I'm 28 years old and I have no idea what they were talking about in that thing. So uh, maybe, it's you're, they're, maybe they're I have a lot to learn. They're right. They're, they're more <laughs> advanced sexually than you. But uh, uh, yeah, and, and so like they, they were looking for that, couldn't find it. As soon as I know that they get there eventually, but as soon as Deborah mentions the, the vex, vasectomy, I was like, why doesn't Ray have that anyway? I know. Like he does not want to have children. Right. I can't imagine him wanting to have more children. And he would do literally anything that would increase his chances of having sex. And it turns out he will. Right. So uh, Ray goes, Ray decides to have a vasectomy. And they go, he goes to the pizza place, Nemo's, to see what the hot waitress is going to wear for a <laughs> Halloween costume. And I do love that. My it was, God. I do love that it was like not a sexy Halloween costume. It was a, uh, it was, she was a nun. She just had, cl- like, she, she just, just wearing normal cleavage. clothes and she comes over and they're all so horny that they're like, oh my God, can you believe she wore that? <laughs> that like, is something I can safely say. The old go into the copy shop to, to get copies because the girl that works there is cute. Yeah. Joey and Chandler. Yeah. Go into a pizza place. I'll t- if I'm going to a pizza place, it's because I'm horny for that pizza. Yeah. I 
I've never gone any place to be like, I'm going to get to look right. at a person. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that Are is you true. kidding me? You absolute horn buffoon. This was pre-internet, though. Like, now, you can, if you want to just look at something hot, you can just go on the internet. I'm never like, so I'm just, I love Nev Campbell. I'm never like, oh, man, yeah, I got to see a picture of Nev Campbell right now. I mean, yeah, there is no excuse because, like, they still had magazines. They still, like, I, I bet Ray could get off to, like, a People magazine. And you're married. I mean, I understand. I understand. I shouldn't understand this. I don't know why Ray needed to let us into that, his, let us that far into his life. That we know he doesn't have a lot of sex. Yeah. But Ray felt the need to <laughs> make that part uh, an integral part of his show. The so, main part of his yeah. show, one would say. So he talks to Robert and his friend about getting a vasectomy. I do like that the he, waitress calls, uh, then he calls his penis my client. Yeah, that's not it's bad. Very, very funny. That's not bad. And like if it's, it's cool of him to do that because he's a dork. But like if Rod... Does it? <laughs> that's true. If Rod's like, but hey, I, babe, my client is a blow. But blah. that's because you couldn't see Rob being in any position to have clients. Rod having penises, you're saying? <laughs> no, just like being in being in a successful life position where he could ha- potentially oh, have like a client. Real clients? Yeah. You can't take him seriously. Yeah. So after talking it over with Robert and his friend and the, uh, the waitress the, and the owner of the pizza place. But by the way, uh, the waitress is not completely... Uh, innocent here because she overhears that he's thinking about having a vasectomy and just tells the neighborhood yeah immediately well whatever why are we to assume that this waitress is like any better than the rest of these bozos that's true and she has dealt with a lot of shit from these bozos right so he uh instead he doesn't get a vasectomy instead comes home with a bunch of condoms and pulls i'll I'll tell you this you know i don't think like dick jokes are funny poop jokes usually not funny sex jokes i usually find sophomoric I've always been a fan of condom humor. Okay. I've always been a fan of, like, buying condom humor. <laughs> one of the few times I did stand-up, one of my jokes was, you have no idea what it feels like to buy condoms and hold on to the receipt. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, just classic just cl- classic uh, Dave stand-up back in the day. Um, Ray comes home, and he says... Yeah, I buy. Yeah, I bought the. They don't say condoms; they call them things. Yeah, I wonder if that was like a network thing. Probably. I don't know. It's like uh, how they how Seinfeld didn't say masturbation. Yeah, but they, condom and masturbation are very different. And it was written like it was very clearly written right on the box when he pulls it out. Right, it says condoms. It all just over says it. condoms. Just it, it was clearly a uh, box for plastic cutlery that they just like painted over. <laughs> yeah, and then wrote condoms on it. So he buys condoms, comes home, and says, yeah, I got them. And I told him I'm going to be a regular there, so keep the tab open. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> that is the good. funniest thing in the world. Imagine buying condoms and being like, and if you think these are the only condoms I need, you got another <laughs> thing coming. This count won't do the trick. See? I'm going to have more. I'm gonna have sex more times than the number that is on this box. Uh, classic very condom good. humor. Very good. And classic... This was where Ray used his horny powers for good. Yes, that's true. And he very rarely uses it for good. So they go trick-or-treating, and they decide they're going to they, But first, they pull a weird move. They, he pulls all the condoms out of the box Put that says the condoms bag. and puts them in a, a non-labeled white bag. Yes. Uh, Pivotal I'm to the glad, episode here. I'm glad you stopped there because the next part of that is a huge reveal. So they go out, and they go trick-or-treating with the kids. and. Uh, but wait. I'm going to interject again. What's that? Uh, Frank's watching the house. Yes. Frank's watching the house uh, while they're trick-or-treating for f- to be able to hand out candy to yes. the neighborhood kids. But first, uh, before they leave the house, he asks a very important question. You still got the Naked Channel. Oh, which, right. Which I didn't is, know if you would get this. No, I get No, I get it. Like, okay. it's, uh, like the illegal porn channels. Right. But it's important to note that he asked for the porn channel when he's house-sitting his son's house... For the oh, yeah. purpose of handing out candy to children. Yeah. Just can't stop being horny. Did you get that, though? He says, do you have the uh, Naked Channel? And he says, yeah, it's all scrambly. Yes. And uh, Frank says, like, that's all I need. Yeah. So back in the, ni- in the no, 90s, I know. before like, dig- all this digital stuff existed, channels that you didn't get, you, it wasn't just a black screen. It was like a fuzzy, scrambly. No, it was like a... 
like all these like greens and different colors and you could kind of see yeah. it but it was just like it was very wavy, wavy. yeah it was I very know. wavy so uh I, yeah I'm, I'm not saying just for you for anybody younger who might be listening i don't know what the cutoff would be for that but that was a that, that was a i laughed out loud at that because i hadn't thought about that in forever because like when i was a kid like when you're a kid you would legitimately go to that channel and just be like See it? Yeah. <laughs> Saw boob. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, but I, I laughed because it's just hilarious that he would uh, openly ask about porn while he's handing out trick-or-treats. It's the horniest episode of Everybody <laughs> Loves Raymond, man. Uh, so Frank runs out of candy, and he's looking for candy that he can give the kids, goes into the kitchen, where in one of the kitchen cabinets, he finds this bag of condoms because... Okay, I live in an apartment. I don't have a big house or anything. I don't keep uh, marital stuff in the kitchen. In in your glass. Uh, in a in glass, glass cupboard. In a glass cupboard behind <laughs> glass where you can see it. And uh, the big thing with these condoms is that they had multicolored wrappers, which was the spiciest thing to hit their sex life in forever. They were very excited for these condoms. They were like, ooh, one's got a yellow wrapper? Ooh, they're different colors? Man, this is gonna be this is gonna be some sex we're gonna have. <laughs> we're getting what we're experimenting. So Frank, of course, sees these condoms and thinks chocolate covered coins, gives them out to all the kids, and Robert is sent to the house as a cop. Because he's getting a lot of calls about some old guy handing out condoms. <laughs> it is a very funny premise for a, for a that show. Was, it was so clever. Yeah, it was it, very funny. Obviously, huge plot hole of that being the placement of the condoms. Yes. But super funny. Everybody Loves Raymond is great because it is such a, like, a dumb, lazy show where it's just literally just one thing per episode. And yeah. that's it. They don't get sidetracked. They they just focus in on one thing and they go right to the end. Yeah, there generally isn't two storylines. There's no. not like a here's what Deborah's doing, here's what Ray's doing. It's generally here's why Ray ruined everything today. <laughs> yeah. and sometimes they'll they'll focus on Robert. Sometimes they'll focus on Deborah's parents. But if they're focusing on Robert, then like it's Ray's r- problem, right? And Ray and Deborah only talk about that problem with Robert. Yes, everything is. There's never like a B storyline. One thing, yeah. Which I don't know for like a half hour sitcom. I don't hate the move. I don't hate it at all. Like it, it makes it so easy to fly through. Yeah, because you you literally just turn your brain off and watch one storyline play out for like twenty three minutes and then you're done. Yeah, what I loved about the show, The Practice, I'm sure a lot of shows did this, but. They would have two storylines, and halfway through the episode, one would wrap up and a new one would start. So there was always, uh, so there was a, or an so hour? every an hour. Okay. So every episode is always picking up one thing and introducing another. But it's not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So there's always some overlap, but it never feels like it's all kind of starting at the same time. Shouts out the practice, great show. Uh, yeah, well, I'm so glad we watched this episode. Same. I it was great. I had not seen it before. No, me neither. And I probably end, had at some point, but I don't remember it at all. At the end, they go to finally have sex because they recovered one of the condoms somehow? Yes. And he uh, hunted down the kid dressed as Dracula, and he purchased the condom and, like, two candy bars off of him to throw him off the scent. I like that move. Well, that that's a classic condom buying move. Yes. You, got, got. you buy other things so that you're not just buying condoms. Which... Is the dumbest thing in the world, especially in the self checkout era. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even. Yeah. I don't know how how often it gets done in the self checkout era. Maybe just to like bury the the site of the condoms when yeah. you're going into the self checkout. I don't know. That's a very funny. Uh, it only makes the condom purchase look weirder when you're like buying like beef jerky. Right. And They're like, deodorant. wait, this isn't all together, <laughs> yeah. right? That's a weird. I was thinking the other day. There's some uh, kind of phobias or neuroses that you have. When you're young, that you realize, like, absolutely isn't weird. But it's still funny. It's still funny that, like, this, this shouldn't have been weird. Like, this, this this guy being an adult going around buying condoms, he was saying to Deborah that he was very in his head about it. Which yeah. is why when he buys the colorful ones and says, keep the tab open, it's like this big breakthrough for him. Yeah. But, like, 
they sell them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like they, they're assuming people are going to buy them. Yeah, I don't know why it's like such a difficult thing, but I don't know. I I I I've been there, and it's is Whoa. weird, and it is like it's a weird thing just to be like these people are looking at me. It's like a rushed. It's it's a rushed thing. You like yeah. You like ring, ring it up quickly, put it in the bag quickly. But it's stupid. They're being sold. Right. They're legal. Right. And they're good yeah. things. They are very yeah. like they're very positive things. A guy, I remember. I feel like people are judging me, being like. That guy's not having sex. What's he buying those <laughs> yeah, for? Yeah, right. Well, that, that, that's why I had the joke about holding on to the receipt, <laughs> yeah. buying buying condoms. I, but I remember that, like, even when I was uh, I was youngish and uh, working in a grocery store, and a guy came up to me and he was like, "Hey, man, where are the uh, rubbers?" And really? I was like, "Rubbers?" And he was like, "Yeah." And I told him where it was, and I remember it was like a very enlightening moment for me. I'm like, man. Everybody's weird. I guess it's. I mean, like, I, I understand it for kids and stuff, like teenagers, because God forbid you run into somebody and they f- you feel like you're, they're gonna fucking tell your parents. And that's like when you're not supposed to be having sex. Mm. But even if you're not supposed to be having sex and you're, and buying, you're condoms, buying condoms, good for you. Shouts so out. I don't know. Like that was like my biggest fear is like I would fucking run into somebody that I knew when I was like a teenager. Shouts out. Good behavior. Shouts yeah. out. Anyway, he gets he buys one of these condoms back. And doesn't check. He's just as stupid as Frank. He goes, folks, it's a chocolate-covered <laughs> coin. Deborah eats it and says goodnight. Yes. What an episode. And he, he watches Sports Center. So, just yeah. like every other episode of Everybody Loves Raymond, literally the plot to every episode of Everybody Loves Raymond is Ray gets horny, mm-hmm. he doesn't have sex, and then he just watches Sports Center. Horniness score on this one, uh, I'm going to say 31 out of 10. <laughs> yes. 30, it's definitely 10. It's, it's more than three times... We'll get, well, you know what? The legal limit. You know what? Uh, Halloween is 1031. Oh, this wow. one's 31 out of 10. Wow. How about that? All right. This one, this will be the last one because this one comes the last uh, chronologically. 1999, an episode of Dawson's Creek called Escape from Witch Island, season three, episode seven. And you're probably thinking, guys, I don't hear you talking about Dawson's Creek too much. It's because we don't watch Dawson's Creek. I had never seen an episode of Dawson's Creek before this. Had you? I had, but not in a long time, and I never watched Dawson's Creek all the way through. It's always just like sporadic episode viewings. Okay, so I don't know anything about Dawson's Creek, but this is actually going to be an okay experiment because if it goes well, don't hate the idea of us reviewing random episodes of shows we've never seen before. Popping in and out. Yeah, just... just Stopping by. Catching a little bit. Uh, All right, let's do this. Previously on Dawson's Creek, Andy is pleading her case to Pacey. To not break up with her. She had sex with another guy six months ago, and she feels that Pacey is punishing her. Joey, meanwhile, took her top off for Dawson, but he said, quote, we can't do this. Put your shirt back on, Paula Cole. Ooh, okay. And now we are in this new episode. Yep. We now know what's happened previously in Dawson's Creek. Didn't need to see any of the... What episode? This is season three, episode seven. Covered all the bases there. Yeah. I will say, uh, very upset. I watched uh, this episode on YouTube, and I didn't get any Paula Cole. Mm. It's a weird, uh, must be like a weird music rights thing. Possibly. Because I got some weird fucking song that was not Paula Cole. And I, the one thing that I was very excited about for watching an episode of, da- of Dawson's Creek yeah. is I Don't Want to Wait. That classic. It's a classic. Such that a was her song. second big single. Her first, of course, being Where Have All the Cowboys Gone. Okay. Okay. So... Joey comes into the video store where Dawson works, asking him if they have the crucible. She needs it because there's a paper due on the book the next day. But between taking care of a baby and, quote, getting the B&B up and running, she hasn't had time for the pesky endeavor known as schoolwork. Here is a case where I feel previously on Dawson's Creek has let me down. Yes. Did not (laughs) cover where the fuck that baby came from. Where's the baby coming from? (laughs) You said something about a (laughs) B&B? Uh, so they have some awkward small talk and Dawson reveals she doesn't need to write that paper because he's been assigned the same paper and instead found a workaround. He's going to do a documentary and anyone who helps him with a documentary does not do the paper either. It seems that Dawson, again, never seen the show before, is the tray to the Creek's Laguna Beach. What is, I don't know what, what's Trey do in Laguna Beach? Remember Trey? No, I don't have, I don't have like the, the names down. Trey was, uh, he didn't make it to any of the, the spinoffs, but Trey was, uh, he was one of the guys, he was a real goofball, real free spirit, 
He was big into making documentaries. Everything okay. that he was doing, he was making a documentary. He liked making films. Okay. Which I think, like, I, I see, I saw that Dawson's a guy that makes films. And I was like, oh, that's stupid thing that exists among young people. I'm like, that's no different from, like, being the kid who plays guitar. Yeah, no, not really. But the thing that doesn't make any sense that I picked up from this episode of Dawson's Creek is that uh, Dawson works at a bookstore. No, he doesn't. He works at the video store? Video store. He and oh. Pacey work at a video store. You can see in the background, it says Pacey's Picks. Okay. I, I knew that Pacey did. I thought that, I was going to say, I, it does make sense that Dawson works at the bookstore and Pacey works at the video store when Dawson wants to be a videographer. Ah. But now, it's Maybe been cleared up. To an end. But I guess that, I think I got confused. They got to support their she, condom habit. She needed, yeah, she needed the book, uh, but she didn't want to read the book, so she went for the video. That makes sense. Okay. Yes. So, they decide that... Uh, they're all going to work on this documentary together about a place called Witch Island mm-hmm. that we will soon learn about. Uh, I'll say Oba Baba Tunde, who plays Barry Gordy in the classic miniseries The Temptations, was the principal in this. I didn't know that. No. Me neither. From having not seen Dawson's Creek. <laughs> yeah. Shouts out that guy. It's amazing. So here's the background on uh, Witch's Creek as we learn from some footage. Witch's Island. They're going, which, what did I say? Which, which is Creek. Creek. <laughs> which island? No, the uh, Creek belongs to Dawson. Yeah. They're going back and forth between the normal show and Dawson's shitty documentary. <laughs> and we learn in 1692, 13 teenage girls were banished to a small island on the New England coast because they were suspected of practicing witchcraft. And a year later, a fire killed them all. After that, it became a spot for high schoolers to go hump. And they're discussing... The Blair Witch Project, because everybody's saying like, "Yo, Dawson, seems Must like you just saw, that time. yeah, you just saw a Blair Witch Project, <laughs> and now you're going to make this Witch Creek thing, which island? Island. Was Witch Island <laughs> thing? <laughs> the creek is Dawson's. The island is the witches. Uh, I'm quite taken by the dialogue in this show. Are you? It is the craziest dialogue. The way these characters speak to each other. So they're discussing the Blair Witch Project as this show is clearly centered on joey says she was scared to which pacey responds quote it's no surprise there potter after all you are quite the skittish kitten (laughs) (laughs) that was like it fucking comes straight from england and at that point i texted one of my friends who was very into dawson's creek and i was like hey is the dialogue in this show really stupid and she was like yeah you might and it was over that she was like but it's, but it's not stupid in the way that you would expect for, like, a show about high schoolers. Like, they're way yeah, smarter like, than these they like should be. Are these, like, dopey kids just trying to have sex? Or, like, what are they? <laughs> they are like, are they like, getting good grades? <laughs> yes. It is very difficult to find out, like, who these kids are. Like, Dawson feels like a fucking 35-year-old trapped inside of a high schooler's body. Yeah. And I don't understand what the characters are at all. They're way too smart to be in high school, but also they talk and do stupid, idiotic things. Here's what I can glean. Dawson is straight up Trey, thinks he's like this super smart guy. And if, I, if this character's name is not Trey, I feel very bad. But one of the characters on Laguna Beach is like that. He thinks he's the smartest guy, thinks he's, he fancies himself a philosopher. He's a filmmaker, all this stuff. Uh, Joey seems to be having a bit of a rough time in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joey is perennially down. Yes. Yeah. A bit of an Eeyore, that one. Yes. Uh, Pacey is, uh, Pacey also thinks he's the smartest guy in the world. Yeah. He's like more, he's more uh, like obnoxious and sort of like, like silver spoon kind of annoying. Totally. Although he mentions he's the black sheep of his family. But I, I think that like the silver, the silver spoon black sheep. Right. Where it's like, he, he thinks that he's, uh, he's been sort of down on his luck, but it's really like, no, you're just an asshole and your family is like, is ashamed of you (laughs) yeah and then there's my favorite character jen because she's played by michelle williams and michelle williams is the the ghost love michelle williams and uh well i hate to break it to you how uh dawson's creek ends does she die oh yeah really yeah whoa she's a real she's a real think of think for herself her she's like she's like a bit of a wild card well, I, w- I would just say like a, f- a free spirit, an yes. honest yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Where are they? These people, where she's living amongst a bunch of frauds. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, Pacey and Jen apparently have never hooked up with each other. This is revealed in a scene that I had to clip because the dialogue is so outrageous. 
Take a listen. Doesn't that just warm your heart? Kevin and Winnie taking those first tentative steps back to the wonder years. Actually, it just makes me really glad that you and I had the forethought never to hook up. Amen, Sister Christian. Why is that, do you think? Well, if you look at the clinical research, you'll find that the smart-ass sidekick, he never gets a girl. Oh. Now, the real reason there was never a you and me, Lindley, is because you and me, we don't need anything from each other. I'm sorry, I left my decoder ring back in the cereal box. You see, you, what the fuck? as the girl <laughs> whose wanton ways had her banished to the boonies, you needed the affection of the unblemished small town pure heart to validate you in your oh-so-vulnerable time, right? Yeah. Me, as the perennial black sheep of the Witter brood, I guess I just needed the love and affection of a woman whose drive and devotion would so shame me to the core that it would force me to get in touch with, uh, I don't know, shall we call it my inner achiever? <laughs> but you and me, we're different. We're on a level playing field. It makes so much sense that we don't see them hang out with anybody else because just the what? worst people in high school. <laughs> oh, my Kyrie Irving. <laughs> Dude, Where they do you know one word spring? that you just said? He doesn't know. He has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> what the hell was that? And and I didn't realize they're playing it back. What is with the George Clooney? Like, yes, like, he has the exact oh, well, same delivery. See? Yeah, oh. yeah, he oh, thinks he's hot I'll shit. I'll tell man. you why. I'll tell you why. Toots, the reason we haven't humped is because of this and blah blah blah. God bless Jen. She's like, I, it was a bit sorkiny of her to say, "I'm sorry, I left my decoder ring at yeah. home." But where, she, like, where she's like mocking him what are you when she's about? doing the exact same shit. Right. But He's a little more insufferable. But I don't know. Maybe sometimes maybe we should do an episode where we're all all clooned up like <laughs> Pacey. Maybe it'll it'll get us all sorts of casual chicks, which is what, what Pacey seems to desire. So that I just realized that I'm that that's also kind of uh, Bomani Jones. And a little bit of Matthew McConaughey. And so it's like it's you put, really put, like put Bomani, George Clooney, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, those three. You're really muddling the the, uh, the insult here. Yeah. <laughs> eh. But uh, the the pact that those two make in this episode is literally ripped straight from Seinfeld. It's ripped from everything. It's two people saying, "Hey, whenever somebody mentions to you like, hey, so we have never done anything sexual before," <laughs> that is them saying, "I'm thinking about that," and then the two people. Determine where do they yeah, go from there. But, but it's super on the Seinfeld nose where it's like, we'll make this pact. We'll come up with some ground rules. We'll for sure never develop feelings for one another. I cannot give Seinfeld credit for that. That is in everything. There have been a hundred movies made about that before and after. But you know what? The Seinfeld one probably happened like two or three years before That's this. That's true. Seinfeld one probably so this was 1999. Ah, Seinfeld probably like, probably like seven six years. years ago. Yeah, yeah, something like that. But still, no, like I mean, very close. There's always, but but I mean, again, I, I can't give Seinfeld credit for that. That is, that is, in everything, everything. There's people say, I suppose, oh, but this one. What if we tried having casual sex though? What if what what if we call it casual? Hey, one rule though, you can't get feelings. It can't be love. Like. All right, cool. Give I did. A a, I saw a great tweet the other day that was. Uh, uh, I love the term casual sex because it implies that there's like athletic rank sex. <laughs> okay. Competitive rank sex. Ca no, but that that would be like uh, recreational sex, wouldn't it? No, you casual would, and recreational are like the same thing. Not in sports. No one's ever said like, "Hey, I'm going to play in my casual league that doesn't count." I suppose. Competitive ranked, I think, is is a uh, is a nice little alternative there. Did you give that tweet a retweet? I did not. Oh yeah, I wouldn't either. Yeah. That was, that's not that good a tweet. Nobody needs to see. I know. I, I I thought it was a great tweet. I just don't think anybody needs to see that retweeted from me. Yeah. I did you like it? No. I, I just give it a like. I just gave it a giggle when I saw it. That's not that good. <laughs> um, hey, vote. Was that a good tweet? Text the text into the show. Was that a good tweet? I, Pete thinks it was. I don't that was think a good it tweet. Was. I think it was a very good tweet. Uh, Maybe it's the gamer in me, because yeah. there's like casual and competitive ranked. Oh wait, so is, is that like video game stuff? Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like sports wise. I was like, no. oh, that's taking a huge leap. No, like casual gamer and like competitive ranked gamer. Okay, so it's terrible dialogue. 
Joey helps Dawson set up for interviews, which is really just her setting up the tripod while Dawson does nothing. <laughs> she is upset that he says, I'm really glad we're friends again. She wants him bad. <laughs> and she's sad about it. So documentary footage reveals kids disappeared at this island over the years. The guy who's going to take them to the which island dogs Dawson big time. Dawson takes out his camera and says, hey, can I ask you some questions for this documentary? He takes out a camera that he has, and he says, only if I can ask you some questions for my documentary. He says, what's your documentary about? He says, all the doofbags like you who are making Blair Witch wannabe documentaries right now. Classic pretty burn good. that he had a camcorder ready in case this joke came out. <laughs> it was pretty good. It was a nice little burn. I wrote that down in my notes, too. Uh, I also wrote down that... Witch's Island has the worst hospitality of any place in the world. What? Why? Because oh, it's like one person? No, it's just nobody wants them to be there. They're yeah. all very rude. Yeah. Uh, and it, like, it just seems like a place that nobody would want to go to. Everyone's like, get out of here! It is the Dick's last... Don't go in there! It is like the Dick's last resort of uh, tourist destinations, except they're not being mean as a bit. Yeah. They're just being mean to you. Biggest thing I noticed with the trip to Witch's Island is that which island is so close to where they live. Yeah. It is not. When they say banished to an island, it is on the other side of a tiny lake. Yes. Like five minutes you swim max. See, you can see the, the town. Like, like a you, five minute casual You can have a conversation swim. with a person in the town while you're on Witch's Island. You could call across. Like well, yeah. if you were just swimming like very casually, it would take you what, five minutes to Probably. get over there? So... That was stupid. That's a terrible place to banish somebody. I would say banish somebody a little further. And also, like, it's stupid because they're they're like what sixteen years old. They probably would have been there before, right? If it's like this, this it real seems hot like a real boring, spot. yeah, real boring town that they live in, and there's nothing to do there. They'd probably ha- would have been to Witch's Island by now. So Pacey and Jen are starting up this will they won't they thing that I'll tell you, I'm not very interested in. I do find it interesting that. Uh, Pacey's acting all cool and hip and everything. Jen is borderline like Jen's really taking control here. Yeah. She's she, she's taking the lead, being yeah. like, Oh, Mr. Tough Guy, the only reason we haven't had sex is because of this, because of that, blah, blah. Okay, why don't you put your money where your mouth is, tough guy? And he's like, Oh, well, the thing you gotta consider with <laughs> these things. Now <laughs> he's now he's built. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh so, they're doing that. At some point... Uh, there's also, th- by the way, there's like a C storyline. Yeah, they're shooting back to Andy. Who's Andy? I was just about to get to that. Andy, the and girl... The blonde from girl? The, uh, from previously on. Okay. The Is one she, they used to date. Oh, she made out with Pacey. The, the, or the, she dated she, Pacey. She was dating Pacey, and then she cheated on him, and he broke up with her. She's back at the school, becoming like a hall monitor or something? Yeah, And enforcing like the rules way blanket. too strictly? <laughs> yes. And the principal at some point is like, yo, these rules are mad old. Get <laughs> out of here. She is... I think she, he gives her detention. She is 2019 in human form. She's just offended by everything and getting yeah. everybody in trouble. Get, trying to cancel attention. everybody. She cancels a guy for his sideburns <laughs> too long. <laughs> super, super rude. Uh, so meanwhile... I had all, no interest in that, by the way. They, they all get split up. It's Joey and Dawson... Pacey and Jen. Pacey splits off to go find a tree to piss on. Classic Mark. Yep. And uh, Dawson and Joey are really getting into it about their relationship, their past. It's all Joey wants to talk about, and Dawson wants nothing to do with it. He says, quote, God, Joey, this is not the time or the place to run through an exhaustive dissertation on our relationship. He I want to punch dissertation. I want to punch this character <laughs> so badly. I can't tell who I hate more between these two. He's he's using uh, the word dissertation and being annoyed at how somebody else is acting. Yes. Pacey and Joey, or Pacey and Jen, are going into places they're not supposed to go. People saying, hey, get out of here. Don't go in there. They're drinking a, uh, they drink a potion called Witch's Brew. Yeah, she not, makes it. She makes it, yeah. You're, yeah. Not supposed to, you're not supposed to have it. You're not supposed to drink it. And at one point, Pacey says... To Joey, to Jen, in a very romantic moment, this may be the witch's brew talking, but you're starting to look all kinds of cute. <laughs> like, That's how you land him, fellas. Because she's Michelle Williams, you're she's right. maybe starting to to maybe look okay to you, Pacey. This is oh, this is enough for you, Pacey. 
<laughs> this is enough for this is enough for you, you, you black sheep of your family. It's important to know that the witch's brew is supposed to trick him or put him under a spell to fall in love with Michelle Williams. Shouts out Maya from Midsommar. Yes, true. Yeah, but like that's that the old pubes in the. That's how good Pacey thinks that he is. Is yeah. that he needs a a concoction of a spell to make him think that Michelle Williams is good enough for him. Yes. So they're making out and they're trying stuff. They're doing things they've never done before. And Joey and Dawson are still having a hard time arguing about their relationship. And it sets up my favorite moment of the whole show. Joey's saying, you know, I've been thinking about the last year, blah, blah. And are we supposed to be together? Blah, blah, blah. And Dawson says, why can't we just live in the present for once? And she responds, because the present sucks, Dawson. <laughs> that is the new it's Monday and people are pissed. The present I'll be starting, sucks. Right. We'll be we don't starting, record on Mondays anymore, so that could be a great we'll thing to rip. We'll be starting episodes every now and then with the present sucks, Dawson. <laughs> Why? And then you get into it. Love I can idea. already see the T-shirt. Yeah. I heard that and I was like, oh, man, that is that is content for Anyos's. And Which that is, is like such a good response to anything. Yeah. The present what's, what's sucks, about, Dawson. Gee, what's, what's crawled up your butt today? The present sucks is what got him. <laughs> it's a great line. And it, I also feel like that completely encapsulates uh, Joey as a character. Right. She is down on everything and she's completely obsessed with Dawson. So the present sucks, Dawson, is just she doesn't need to say anything else. Because the pre- she does go on and she says yeah. stuff, but I, I missed it because I was I just I went right into my notes. So it was like, ah, present sucks, Dawson. Uh, and then they end up getting back. They they stay on the the night. They, they get stay on ditched the island. on the island by the guy who runs the ferry, uh, which is just a boat. Yeah, small. And boat. so he takes the boat, and then the boat somehow magically reappears on the island. Yeah, I don't get that. That's it, a plot hole. That was the part where everything was supposed to get scary. And that was the part where the show just lost me. Yeah. I stopped caring. Really, what, once once the present sucks Dawson happened, I was like, I'm not going to like anything as much as, <laughs> as I like hit this. Hit the peak. Yeah. So they end up getting back. I'm sure there's some scary stuff. It wasn't scary. They do some stuff they weren't supposed to do. And uh, they get back. Pacey and Jen agree to have casual sex. And Dawson's documentary ends up being about how Joey was sad about him. Because in the biggest twist in the world, and again, I don't know these characters at all. Dawson makes it about him. Yeah. Also, at the very end of the episode, they uh, Dawson and Joey are having a conversation, and Joey just like casually drops that Dawson may have may have been on crack earlier in the episode. She and says something series. about like the crack. The crack habit is messing with your mind or something, or like messed with his like circuits. Yeah, I don't know if she just casually dropped like, "Hey, remember when you were on crack?" I can't remember if that was like if that's how we talked back then. If be like, hey, oh man, you're all, oh man, you you've had too much crack today. But Joey doesn't seem so. like a real like jokester to just throw around like, hey, I'm a I'm a joke that you were on crack. Well, she was seemingly joking about taking care of a baby in B and B because she <laughs> ditched that, that for like two baby. days. <laughs> Did, didn't she say that though? She said the, between the baby and the. I didn't catch that. I could have I could have just thrown that in there. I don't know. I haven't seen the I haven't seen the rest of the show. So how horny was this episode in your estimation? Uh, quite horny. I would say around an eight. I would say that uh, I'd say it was mostly brought from from Jen and Pacey. Yeah, but I mean, Joey was maybe not like overtly jo- yeah, horny, jo- but she Joey was thirsty. Joe, I, I don't please do not let the previously on Dawson's Creek <laughs> bleed into your. Your oh, judgment true. of this episode. She did not pop her top off. We have right. to. We have to p- p- throw that in there. Right. Absolutely. This didn't. Right. No pops. Tops popped. I'll tell you. Joey didn't seem to want sex from Dawson in this episode. I think no. she she wanted. She wanted. She was she emotionally thirsty. She wanted familiarity. She, right. She wanted, she's emotionally thirsty. She her big thing. She gives a speech about how she misses the connection that she has with. With Dawson, which is like a and like to to their credit, they were alone on this island where like there's a lot of a lot of humping that goes on between these high schoolers right, and they call it Hump Island. Yeah, right. and and their their friends, their two closest friends, 
who had never hooked up before. Yeah. Even they were getting into like the the, the early stages of humping. Yeah. And these two uh, lovers or, or past lovers didn't reignite the flame. So they weren't that horny. Now, I hate to – Lord, forgive me. I'm about to dip outside of this episode. <laughs> but I was told that Pacey and Joey were a thing at one point. Yes. Yeah. So, it creates a, a, a real tension in Dawson's Island. Man, how do they how do they navigate that? Now, is do, does the, do you know if this is before or after those two were together? I do not know. Were Pacey and – were Joey – and Dawson, like the Kelly and Zach, where like they were like the main thing, and sometimes they I took think breaks, so. and yeah. sometimes they yeah. saw other people. But yeah. they're the, the the two that are supposed to be. Like together. they were meant, they were meant to be together. Everybody was like, yeah, those two, thickest thieves. Interesting. Uh, you know what? I got to give uh, Dawson's Creek some credit. Whenever I see a '90s show now, I am drawn to how in the opening credits, in the title credits, they'll say all the guys first, and then all the girls. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's just like one of those subtle things that I'm sure they, like, they didn't think twice about. And they're like, what? We're just we're just listing them in some order. And they just happen to choose all the guys first. And then do they, they do that in Friends. I think I could be wrong. But like you see it with Say by the Bell, things like that. And uh, in this, I must have missed when they showed Dawson because the first two I saw were uh, Katie Holmes and Michelle Williams. And I was like, I stood up clapping. I'm like, oh hell yeah! Don't and don't don't even do a and James Vanderbeek. Just mix him in there, man. Just because it's Dawson's Creek, it doesn't mean this is all about him. I feel like, Friend, but I think he I, went first. I feel like Friends did uh, the, the the women first. I, f- I could be wrong about that, but I always remember that like David Schwimmer was last. Oh, true. Let's see. Let's fire it up. Got first. I'll say before we get Jennifer to it, Anson it wouldn't surprise first. me if it's the girls first because Courtney Cox was hot shit. She That's was the true. only famous one. Let's see. Jennifer Aniston first. Jennifer Aniston first. Friends, Courtney Cox. Not problematic. Courtney Cox yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. Lucy so Kudrow. All the girls. Yeah. yeah. So shout out friends went the, the girls first. Score a badly needed one for friends. Wait, could they have possibly uh, just gotten away with going in alphabetical order is that alphabetical order oh you know what aniston cox kudrow uh who, leblanc leblanc perry, perry schwimmer, schwimmer. Alf- oh man we sorry, can't friends. even give him credit sorry just conveniently worked out that way they went alphabetical order but i i bet in hindsight they should say like nah we were i mean we could, they if, if you had to the girls if you had to pick the ways to list it, I don't think I would change a thing. Yeah. Like, I think that that is very uh, I do like they do, like, the, like the kind of boys versus girls. Yeah, because it's a big, it. it's a big uh, part of that show. Right, that there's three guys yeah. and there's three girls. Yeah. But, yeah, that's wild. Uh, Courtney Cox, though, I think when that show... She came, probably would Oh, no, it, it is true, because she was... Uh, I think she was making... Way more money. I think she was like the only one getting paid on Friends early. Yeah, like she was like the the get. Yeah, I think that she would have been listed first. Yeah, shouts out, Courtney Cox, always playing bad people. <laughs> uh, this uh, this concludes all the Halloween classics. We've now seen all the Halloween classics, and now it's the moment you've all been waiting for. Where, the butt go? They have different levels of scariness, horniness, extreme horniness. In the case of one. You have to weigh in how they age, how they've aged, laughs, scares, self-awareness, self-awareness. But, but it brings us to a, like a, a very clear winner. Yes. It's Everybody Loves Obviously. Raymond. Come on. Obviously. You let me violate you. You let me penetrate you. You let me desecrate you. I've torn apart my insides 
I've got no soul to sell The only thing that works for me Help me get away from myself I wanna fuck you like an animal I wanna feel you from the inside I wanna fuck you like an animal My whole existence is flawed You bring me closer to figure all that out right now. I mean, what's wrong with just living the present for once? Because the present sucks, Dawson.